Als je die afkondiging is doen, gebruik je mic. Die microfoon is daar zo op je tafel. Ja. Yeah, yeah, the more... Okay. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I don't think this mic makes a sound towards <laughs> you, but it's more for our um, colleagues that's um, tapping in from the live stream. Um, from other campuses, they are viewing this whole session uh, on YouTube. So we are exploring that the same as we did with one of our uh, sessions on decolonization and it worked very well. So we are planning as CTL in future to do this more often, to include people from other campuses and the same with them if they've got uh, events on their campuses so that we can join them. Okay, so I want to uh, welcome everyone of you this morning. Um, I'm so happy that, that all of you came um, because this is such an important mm -hmm. um, phase in, in, in for, for Center for Teaching and Learning to really um, reconceptualize and rethink how we can support our lecturers and our faculties best regarding curriculum design and development. So we thought it well to import a, a guest from Sydney um, all the way from Australia and Prof. Paulus Flakopoulos I say That's that quite close, yeah. Is um, from Macquarie University of, um, in Sydney, and he has been all over from UK, New Zealand, and Australia, and he's been five years now at Macquarie University, and he is the associate de associate dean for quality and standards um, regarding teaching and learning matters. He is speci especially with the Faculty of Arts, but he has got an institutional responsibility as well to make sure that teaching and learning is at the at top, top of his game in his industry, uh, in the university. So we are very excited to have you here. Mm -hmm. He has been um, what we know as the Carpe Diem process. Myself and Esmeri met him um, uh, yes. when we went for an international visit. And 
uh, when we talked to him, it seemed like they struggled with the same things that we struggle in our carpeting to make sure that, that it's more effective. And um, in our discussions, he worked on a, on a process called the DDI, and it's Design, Develop, Implement. Mm -hmm. And he'll explain what that means just now. But um, that, was, that, that triggered myself and Esmeri to say that that's something that we can um, use that process to enhance our current processes. So we welcome you, Prof. Ponos, and we are very, very privileged to have you here. And uh, we've got two academics that's joining us today. They registered for the workshop, and we want to welcome them as well. And um, sometimes, Prof. Ponos, if you would like their um, opinion on mm -hmm. things for, for, for lecturers or even our CTL staff, if we make a suggestion or we uh, talk about something, let's ask them because they are in an academic seat and they are the ones that require the support mm -hmm. in, in the design of their modules. So uh, welcome to them as well. We will not do a formal introduction of, of everybody because we all know each other um, very well. So we, you will have to uh, engage with Panos throughout the session. We've got coffee and tea available at the back um, just when you outside the doors. So you can access that anytime if you feel like quickly want to uh, a break or quickly go mm -hmm. get yourself some coffee. We'll have a comfort break during the um, during the course of the morning. So you are welcome to interact with him at any time. Okay, so with that Lovely. said, uh, we welcome you and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Lani. You. Welcome, you. colleagues. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my third year now in South Africa, so I get to, to enjoy the climate, the food, the people. So I, I'm extremely happy for the invitation. Uh, the introduction was spot on about what I'm doing. Just a bit of more about myself. By, well, I'm Greek, although I spent the majority of my career overseas in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. I was born in Greece. I studied in Greece my first degree, philosophy and education. And then I moved and I continued my uh, academic career primarily in Scotland and in the United Kingdom. So married. Two children, a three months, a seven months old, and a three years old. So I need a bit of more sleep. So it's good when you travel; you can get to sleep, you know, without <laughs> without interruptions. And uh, I've been involved in the area of higher education to, in different roles over 17 years now, since approximately 2001, 2002. My main um, passion is actually. Interactivity is engagement, student engagement, and with this thing in mind, I took on a number of responsibilities from being a lecturer, a researcher, actually a learning designer myself for a period of time, and a developer, all the way now to a more kind of leadership position as an associate dean, and getting to see the big spectrum of how things that we do on the ground ourselves, people like you, they have an impact at, at, uh, at the highest level in the university. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you. There's not going to be a lot of kind of PowerPoint. It is what it is. You know, it's good to give you visuals, but that's not the main thing today. I think the main thing will be to tell you the story, tell you about the DDI and why at Macquarie University we decided that we need to invest people's time and money to do it. Share with you a number of successes and a couple of very, very, you know, like big failings in the process and, and why they, they happen. And then I would like you to interact with me as much as we can. So it's, it's going to be a couple of hours, so it should not be just me talking, talking, talking. Anytime you will have something, please interrupt. Same, the colleagues, they are looking and watching from the two different campuses. Uh, there are people observing you uh, as you are participants, so you can tell me if there are questions, and we can take questions from them as well. And I hope the sound is good, and I hope the accent is good. You know, it's 100% Greek. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes it could be difficult to understand. Macquarie University, Sydney, east part of Australia, one of the largest cities. We have, get me get it right, I think we have five main institutions and a couple of uh, other institutions having campuses with us. Macquarie is on the north part of Sydney. We only have one campus, roughly 40 to 41,000 students and 16 to 18% of them international students. And we are also one of the biggest providers of online education for the country through a system that calls Open Universities Australia, which is like an open university, but instead of them 
facilitating everything, they get a consortium of universities and they offer the degrees on our behalf. Faculty of Arts is the largest faculty, the second largest faculty actually in terms of numbers, but in terms of departments, we are the largest one. We have 11 departments ranging from philosophy to languages to security studies to law. Law actually is part of our uh, faculty as well. We also have an engineering department, science and engineering, faculty of business and economics, uh, and we have also a new medical school. So it's a growing university, and it was established in 1964 as a university extremely remotely outside Sydney. At the moment, there, there was not even roads at that point. And it was a university for the people that they could not really think about going to universities. It was a university that was providing opportunities to students. So if you read some of our new books now that came out from our vice chancellor, he speaks about going around and seeing um, women with children, going to study in the evening classes, all this kind of idea of open education. This has carried out over the years in the tradition and is very much in the DNA of the university, which has an impact on the way we do education. The reason I'm sharing the story is because I want you to understand how the DDI, the methodology, needs to be aligned to what a university is. And the very first important point I'm going to make today is that whatever you decide to do in your beautiful campus and your beautiful university here, it has to be aligned to your beliefs and your way of doing things. So taking off the shelf a DDI, a carpet diem, an ABC, or any methodology, and using their templates and their resources exactly the way they are, my personal feeling is that it's not going to do you any good. You will end up with artificial outcomes and products. Thinking of the processes and working with them to make your own DDI version is what I recommend, and I'm very clear this from the very beginning. All right? My understanding is that we have a, a, a garden of expertise here from designers, developers, media expertise, graphic designers. Yes? How many of you, you are in a kind of more technical roles, like IT support, media? Okay? And people, they are considering themselves more of academic developers? Okay. And do you have def defined roles for these particular jobs? That's one of the questions I always ask. Because so, at our university, we have what we call a learning designer, a senior learning designer. So there's two positions. And they also absorb the role of the educational developer. So their job is to work with the academics, not only to provide the support in the online or the technical and the uh, e-learning aspect, but also to provide the curriculum advice. And that is a new kind of trend across Australia. Over the last three years, all the advertisements that they used to call for educational developers and designers, now they call for learning designers. So all across the country, there will be jobs being advertised for learning designers, and they will expect that you have this kind of both roles as part of the package. Yeah? And that's uh, academic developers are mostly in universities. They do have strong learning and teaching centers. Our university made a decision in 2015 and officially in 2016 to devolve the functions of a learning and teaching center into the faculties. So I was one of this kind of follow-up where I was an academic in the center, and then I, through that change, they asked me to take up a senior position in the medical school as an associate dean, but also carry a lot of the duties of an academic developer there. And now in the Faculty of, of uh, Arts and Humanities, it's pretty much the same thing. So whatever I'm going to talk today, and the terminology you will see there, reflects a bit Macquarie's terminology. So when we talk about learning designers at this stage, we're talking about people that they are able to advise on both sides, the technical level of, of even of media production, all the way to uh, theory, outcomes, and so on. OK, so far so good, everybody? Great. Now, I'm going to give you a very quick um, personal narrative around learning design theory, primarily because I'm very interested in it. I'm researching it actively. We just had a publication out with a colleague of mine at Macquarie University, Professor Matt Bauer, that we looked in the literature to see what happens in the learning design space, what people they say they do, and what do they mean. And it was a very eye-opening exercise for everybody. And we try to communicate this back to the designers so they don't feel uh, frustrated that we don't have a model or we need to have this, we need to have everything in place. Just to give you a bit an idea of the messy 
environment that exists out there, and that you are not any worse or any better of what happens in universities that they claim that they are doing very good design. Yeah, so I'm quite honest on that. And please interrupt and ask questions as we go. And apologies to people that might have seen this yesterday. There might be one or two that they, they, they saw a couple of this, but I'm going to give it a different spin for your uh, input. When we talk about learning design, we came across more than 300 definitions. Yeah. So looking into the online space, publications, books, papers, and we look to see what people say learning design is, well, th 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 there's hundreds of definitions. And they range from anything that has to do with activity design, very much what happens at the micro level in a unit or a module, as you call it in this country, all the way to what can be called a curriculum transformation, that everything needs to change, everything has to be reviewed. And then within these definitions, you have people adding their context, theory, people, resources, all these kind of things. But there is no unified framework that they will say that these are the four or five things that learning design must have in order to be called learning design. And that gave us the freedom as designers ourselves and people in the educational to th consider what are the ingredients that they must be in place to, to actually say that you are delivering a learning design experience for your university. It's a very important point because if we take, again, off the shelf something, it might work really well for that university that they invented the methodology, but they might be missing things. To me, being in Australia, having an indigenous uh, responsibility towards the people, not having considerations for the, for the indigenous thing in the design, that would be a crime. So we have to add additional parameters and additional things to be considered in order to actually even start thinking about putting a storyboard or anything in the place. If you are in a university that has three campuses and potentially diverse, having a better understanding of the context, the physical and the digital context, will be an add-on to the learning design process. Yes? OK. So this is just a few of the things that we've been using and a few of the things that they exist. But the idea of learning, activities, process, so the bigger the letter in this cloud is, is the more frequently was um, presented in the literature. So no doubt is about learning. Okay? And that is very important when you talk to academics. Do we have academics in the room? Yes. So our academics, they also are for learning. I mean, their main concern when they start designing something, normally what they do, okay, content is important, expertise is important, but at the end of the day, they will be working with people and they, they get their reward by seeing people learning. So our job then from the designer's point of view is how do we support learning? So question one that exists in a learning design model is who is your learners? That is the starting point, and that came very close, very, very close to the idea of what activities. So those two things are must addressed, like they must address at the very beginning. All the way to, you know, different practices, processes, and so on. Any comments on that? Anything that you think uh, add or? It's better, you know, it's easy to say it. It's all about the learning. It gets more complicated when all the uh, policies and bureaucratic aspects of university life comes in place that is all about content, it's also about money, about budgets, and a lot of things. But let's start with the optimistic one. It's about learning. And then we can allow the other parameters to come in. That's the publication I was talking about, Critical Analysis of Technology Enhanced Learning. And my understanding is that you do have a copy printed in front of you. Now, the publication itself came about because myself and Matt, Matt is an associate professor in education, primarily in the school sector. And they are using their own methodologies to do the design. But in the school sector, primary and secondary, the parameters are pretty much defined. Because the curricula, the national curricula, are pretty much given to the people. And they can operate in a much more controlled way. The contrast with higher education is that, just name it, the, in the same course, two different lecturers, they might have a totally different understanding of how this should be designed and what good learning is. 
that goes back to the tradition, to the knowledge, to the expectations, to a different things. So when we put all these frameworks, we're trying to see how many of them actually are complete frameworks. They have enough information for a designer or a teacher to take it, and then they can see that they have a scaffolded approach, and they are able to navigate someone that is new to this idea of learning design in order to complete the task. So we found out that not even a quarter of these uh, frameworks, they do they are actually frameworks. They have enough information there, they are framework. A lot of them, they are kind of initial concepts. Some of them are some kind of uh, uh, models that they've been piloted for some time. A lot of them, they are dead already. Yeah, they've been published, they've been exercised for a period of time. And now if you visit their websites, they don't even exist. Yeah, and I gave yesterday to the executive an example and also uh, talking to the people in the cameras where we do have a lots of thousands of dollars in Australia, and I know that also a lot of money was spent in the UK for good reasons at that time to develop frameworks and resources and ideas. But then the whole thing where, you know, once the funding ran out and once the people driving the design, uh, they simply just disappeared. So what is left it is the theory that exists, and maybe you can reinvent it. Okay? which is fine. This is just a few of the books, and I, I'm not advocating one or another, but gives you a bit the idea. All of them are about learning and are about design. But you can see from the far left learning design um, frameworks that they are uh, spot on in terms of what we can call um, learning design in terms of the methodology they use, all the way to the middle where I have a more, the most seminal book in that area, which is the teaching as design science, and I highly recommend this to you as a, as a way to, to get to understand, all the way to designing for very specialized types of learning, like open learning and so on. Okay, So you will see that there is variation there in how things work. And these are some of the frameworks that we came across. On the left, we have a comprehensive yet not really implementable framework, which came out from the book on the Larnaca Declaration on Learning Design, which pretty much captures everything that happens in a university life when it comes to design. And on the right, we have a very uh, sophisticated, to some extent, approach, but just to design activities. So from the one, you can actually design a whole educational system. And on the right, you can simply design the 20 minutes in a class with 100 students. Which of the two you will use, and if you have to use any of these in order to do your job, it will come down to you and the model that you will decide to adapt. But starting point of saying I'm going to use the, that particular learning design conceptual map framework to do my job, you will figure out that it's not going to meet your needs. It has to be totally adapted to meet your needs. We went also through a phase, and we are still into that phase to some extent, where people that will claim that to do this job, you will need to have also some sort of a, a template. You need to have a number of planners and so on. And I put here three of the most um, seminal planners that exist or used to exist in the area. On the one side, we have the London Pedagogy Planner, still exists in practice. It's an ongoing project funded uh, uh, by the former Joint Information Committee, if I'm right. Uh, it does its job pr perfectly well, but promotes a very much individualistic approach to design. A lecturer has an idea, goes online, there is a platform, you log on, you throw all your ideas there, and somehow the tool, through a sequence of questions, navigates your thinking, and then you, at the end of the day, you have a design plan. Keep this in mind. The end product of a design planner will be a plan. Is this good enough? Is this what our academic need? Just a design plan. LAMS was something that was created in Australia and actually at Macquarie University. Um, people that have different views about it, it's very much a concept map. Yeah? So it is a tool that helps you 
ask, his, ask the right question at the right time to try to navigate your thinking. Very useful, but still could be out of context if you need to ask more difficult questions or different questions. So having something like that and not being able to adjust it and amend it yourselves, again, provides some limitations. And then on the, on the, on the middle, I have Phoebe, who was uh, at the University of Oxford, highly prestigious project at the time. And the idea of Phoebe was actually to develop a community where people, they will, de they will share design plans and they will interact. It's been archived now for many years. No one is using it. So the question of how can you maintain something like that in a university is, is, is very problematic. OK? Any questions about these things so far? So just to, to sum up before I move into the DDI and the need for it, we have a lot of publications, 300 plus definitions, so choose or add another one if you want to make them 301. Lots of uh, models, frameworks, concepts exist at different level. And so far, also a number of interesting tools that they can potentially help us with learning design. Yet, we are still to see a group of people across the globe, if you want, committing themselves to one or the other. And pretty much, they keep reinventing everything. And that is what we did. We're reinventing some of the things that already exist, and we added our own flavor from that point of view. Methodologies is what we are lacking. So we do have theories. We do have templates. We do have exemplars. We do have tools. But we don't have, at this stage as we speak, a methodology that will follow a university complexity. Yeah? So the complexity of the university, I can name a lot of them, especially now as an associate dean, I'm dealing with them. Anything from the university strategic plan, that is a high-level document, but highly influential, to the evaluation of your student in the last semester for the course you are about to redesign, the budgets and the timelines, the procedures of approving and disapproving, the procedures of complaining, all of these things are contextual things that they play into the curriculum design. But we don't really capture them from that. The most dominant and the most used uh, methodology, if we call it for the time, is the Carpe Diem methodology. Okay? Was created originally at, in the UK, if I'm right, at Leicester University. Professor Gilly Salmon, she's been traveled a lot, she introduced it to a number of countries. And it is a methodology that is creative license copyrighted methodology. So if you are doing a Carpe Diem, you are using the Carpe Diem uh, resources and the Carpe Diem way of doing things. And it's been promoted as a way for kind of rapid, rapid transformation, quick transformation. I witnessed it on a number of occasions. I, I was privileged to, was invited by Professor Gilles Salmon at, uh, in Australia when she was there and worked with her on a number of occasions. And what is doing with the Carpe Diem is wonderful for the outcome that she wants to do, which is a micro level change at the unit for things that they need to be changed towards one direction. So the idea of activity is very much embedded in the Carpe Diem. Similar to some extent, but even more compressed, not even two days, not even one day, not even half a day, is the ABC methodology. And the ABC methodology is a carpe diem abbreviated using uh, another of templates and storyboards and so on, but for a very kind of fast, accelerated, um, let's call it accelerated idea generation. So you go there, and within a 90 minutes, I think is on average the way the, it, how it runs. Uh, you go there, boom, boom, boom. Give me your unit introduction to anatomy. What's wrong with that? I have retention issues, and I want also to create something interactive. 90 minutes, we focus on how we can make this part of the unit interactive. Ignoring the same time, or if not ignoring, not taking into account that this unit or module belongs to a bigger picture. It is part of a curriculum. And then the change you will make now as part of this, it might have a longer-term impact. 
it might impact on other things in the curriculum. And at the end of the day, it might be just your own personal you know, appetite to do something, and you will spend time and money of the university to do something that is not proven to be of uh, importance. Yet, if this is what we need, we need little quick improvements towards one direction, I will have no hesitation in doing it. We try them all at Macquarie over a number of years now, eight years. And as we were traveling with these methodologies, particularly the Carpe Diem, we were facing these additional expectations from academics. What do you think was the biggest uh, challenge we had in the Carpe Diem, which I can feel you might have yourselves? Anything that? From your experience of running it or thinking about it, please. Yes. The module at the end of the day. They were kind of not really, they were committed, but not really, you know, totally committed in. Yes. The Perfect. Commitment is big thing. You cannot really embark on an implementation of a design unless there is commitment. And we can try to unpack commitment. I'm going to do that as part of the DDI. Thank you. Anything else? Lack of preparation. Also, the lack of preparation. Not prepared and they expect everything to come from the designers. Mm -hmm. and once there are a lot of ideas coming in, trouble with selecting which one is appropriate. And you expect the lecturer to be the one you're supposed to be advising and expect the lecturer yes. to be the one to decide on which one works. Yes. But they have no because they are not prepared. Great. Preparation. Is it important? Is it not? The models that we will see from the Carpe Diem and the ABC curriculum, because of the nature of it, which is Carpe Diem, Latin, seize the day, yeah? Meaning, don't worry about all the difficulties and everything. Just come and take whatever you can from that day. We don't need you to prepare. We don't really expect you to know. If you can come and leave the room for the day with one or two things, is, is great. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. It works to some extent, and the same with ABC. But preparation, the gap of preparation, becomes evident, at least in our institution, from the very first 10 minutes of introducing, including expectations. So I just gave you another one. Expectations is another big challenge. I can dare to ask our, our, our academics here, what normally would you expect if you engage and you are committed and you are prepared and you engage in a carpe diem or anything, what actually do you expect to be the final end product of this collaboration? All right. Practically used in the class. To me, that speaks that if I leave you with. 10 pieces of paper, and I tell you, that's my job done. There you are. Go off and do the design yourself, the implementation. You might not be satisfied. So you would expect to take something like that, which is going to be a, a number of stickers, and just see it in action. Am I right? Would you agree, disagree? Yes. So there's no use in leaving something that is not going to help your yes. reach other the end product. Perfect. So two things there. One is contextualization. So just don't do the design for the sake of design. And we've seen that on a number of occasions. People coming to large implementation things. It happens as we speak also in my institution, that people that will come with big ideas. That's because they want to be trendy, or because they want their unit to be the most up-to-date, or because they want uh, to, to, to have the more kind of polished looking online space. But that's not necessarily the answer when it comes to, does it actually help the learner? Does it actually provide an opportunity for the learner to do something different? 
you know, I, I ended up in a DDI with uh, the Jewish doc people, the lawyers, and we agreed that actually just keep the book. It's the best answer to what you're trying to do. We went through channels, e-books, uh, QR codes, they will scan and they will have lawyers talking to them. And you say, but what do you want to do out of it? I don't want them to understand these five lines. So if you want them to understand these five lines, well, ask them and, and find an activity that will prompt them to read. So, but we went through very various activities, things, designs, and we ended up to say it's costly, it's important, but at the end of the day, in the root of it, is the ability of them to read. And it is a skill they need to develop as lawyers reading. So we went back to very basics. That's just a quick example of where contextualization works in that space. Preparation, commitment, and product. I'm calling it product, but I'm talking about the experience you are designing for and contextualization. These are all things that they should be part of a learning design. Now, the DDI, it was 2014, four and, a, four and a half years, almost like five years ago. And Macquarie University was working towards a new learning strategic framework, like every university does in a period of at least five years. Most of them, they have a five-year strategic framework and they uh, recreate it. At the time, the Pro Vice Chancellor, who was the learning and teaching um, responsible authority, if you want, for the university, introduced us the framework that looks a bit like that. And this was uh, in negotiation to be released in 2014. So learning for the future was our framework. And the three main pillars of that particular framework were around connecting experiences, about connecting the curriculum, and about connecting people. So, you know, some people, they will just say, okay, here is another piece of document. It's going to go through. Someone will implement it, someone not. In five years' time, it's going to be something different. So whether we agree or disagree, you know, let it be. We are were approached at that time and we say we need to put a system in place, a methodology in place to help academics and teams to grasp these three main concepts and when they design or redesign curricula they will move their new curricula towards these three important priorities. So the DDI came as a response to that call by the PVC where he wanted a learning design framework that will help with this kind of approach. We agreed, and that's something I'm giving you as an information because I, I know from what I hear that you are also working in that space. We had to agree what are the principles of the learning design. And they have to be written and they have to be locked down and to some extent non-negotiable. What I mean by principles is what will define a DDI or whatever you're going to call your way of doing things and be able to advise to people whether they are doing that or they simply do some sort of other methodology. So the DDI methodology was rounded around the principles of collaboration, the principles of agility, so opportunities for them to be able to change things as they progress because some of the DDIs, as I'm going to explain to you, they take over a year to be completed. And also uh, the, the principle of reusability and scalability, that whatever we do should not just be a micro level intervention, but whatever we do, it should be looked for being reused, recreated in other contexts as well. So we can help people speed up their process. In your case, uh, you might want to add additional principles. But the collaboration is an important one. If you do a collaborative learning design framework, means that you commit, going back to the commitment, yourself as an academic to a collaboration and a partnership with a number of people and potentially other academics. If you do that, you are doing DDI. If what you want is a one-to-one -one consultation with a learning designer for five hours to sort out your thing, Maybe you do something more like an ABC methodology or something else. But you have to be absolutely clear when you communicate to academics because they want to know that. What is the commitment? 
and takes time and you won't get it right from day one but you will get it right after you run a couple of carpe b and whatever you're going to use it and the commitment including the most important thing for them which is workload yeah i've been in a situation where i took on people to come and do a ddi agreeing that it's going to take them 16 hours 18 hours we ended up with 120 hours practically speaking to come to what you described the product the final thing they were shocked at the same time and they just but we were honest after that we knew there is no such a thing as a 12 and 16 and 20 hours methodology forget it there is a 12 hour session there is an 18 hour sessions or sessions but the work that has to happen and going back to preparation before and after it's good if you at least have an indication of how long things take in your university to work. One example, and I think you have, you have a report printed out for us. I have an example from a, a, an indigenous education master course, which, we, which is, it should be in, in your printouts, I think. Yeah, over there. It's not important necessarily, though, but it, it is part of this design, develop, implement report that I gave you, where you will see that more than 100 hours were spent on DDIing or carpet DMing it in one way or another. A significant amount of money, including the, the time of the academics calculated into, that, into the process, and the outcome was relatively modest. Yeah, just creating a bit of nice looking uh, LMS version, creating a couple of relatively low profile videos and so on. But it was an, an eye opening for us. So ne next time that someone comes and says, I want to do even these things, that they are simple things, we'll say, well, yes, it's, it's not going to be a, a two day session, I'm sorry. It will be 50 hours, 60 hours, depending on what you have to do. So we keep developing this, and I will, as an advice, I will give this, factor it in your preparation. You, you will get it right essentially as, as you move on. You might need to go over a year of trying out, but do capture through a mechanism. We, we have actually a wiki, looks a bit like that. So this is our institutional wiki page. I don't know if you, you can see it from the back. But very much what we've done is on the left, we have every single session of DDI, how we run it, the agenda, the participants. We scanned all the outputs, whatever they've done it, and then all the evaluations. So it helped us now understand how from 2014 all the way to 2016, where we reached the level that we say the model is stable. Two years, it was an ongoing iteration. Version one, version two, version three, version four, to get it to the point where we felt this is how we do things. Okay, that's another important lesson for us, that capture this information in one way or another and, and be realistic and being able to calculate them from that point of view. Any questions so far? Makes sense, connects with, go on. So are you saying that, that all your DDIs that you've done are at one central page uh, space? So you've got one page for all the DDIs that you've done, or yes. is this just the development of the DDIs? So in the wiki space over there is in one space, I have all the iterations, all the different versions okay. over there. So if they are grouped in a way. over there of the different teams that they participated the different minutes and notes that they they took if okay. that will allow me with the different reports a gallery of things that they took place in the ddi session from the different sessions okay, okay? okay. we treat it as a project so it was the DDI project, and then within the DDI projects, there were the different projects that they were the individual groups that they were running. 
So all of the DDI sessions, they were actually mini projects to us. There was a project management tool that it will start. So if I was um, to work with yourself, self, I will come and I will do a DDI diagnostic thing first. And the DDI diagnostic will be, I need to understand what you want to achieve. I need to understand what are the parameters, what are the priorities. I will need to check how whatever you're going to do complies or not with what we should be doing in this university. You are following the strategy and you are advancing it and so on. I need to understand your workloads. So this is part of the preparation of the DDI. And once we've done that, I will be honest and tell you, I will need six months of your time. And that will be two hours, let's say, every, every five days, uh, every week. Can you commit to that thing? No. Why? Because of this, of this, of this, I cannot relieve it. What is my backup plan? All right, in that case, how much time can you commit? I can commit X amount of time, realistically. This is how much we can progress with a DDI session. And then we can come back and do it later. And almost, not almost, in most of the cases, it was program teams. It was not just individual unit conveners. We tried to economize, throwing us learning and teaching. I was part of the team, as I told you. Throwing myself as an associate professor to support one team of three people for six months, it's not sustainable. It's not even worth thinking about throwing five and six people designers just in a very small team in an intensive kind of DDI. So our idea is try to bring program teams together get them to buy in, and then do more of a, of a, of a program level DDI. And that is one of the second differences uh, that exist between the DDI and the Carpe Diem, that you need to have a bigger picture I perception around it. OK? It's not necessarily that every single academic of that course needs to be present, but it's good if you do have a team. So if your law degree is down in the root, and you have the Juris Doctor or the LLB or whatever, the Master of Laws, to be recreated, you need to have the buy-in, and we will need and we will approach the heads of the departments at minimum to agree that this is the workload of the people. Because otherwise, we will end up wasting a lot of time. <coughs> And, w and when I say waste, it's, it's pity when you end up with a design looking nice on paper, and you have no workload, no budget, no time or anything to progress it until the next academic year or something like that. And that, and that provides issues for us, tremendous issues. So everything is, is, is there, and I will try to see how I can, I can give access so you can see the way that we've done it, uh, and all the evaluations of our academics, what actually they said about it, and so on. Now, going very quickly to the literature, these are some of the ways in which the literature suggests why we do de uh, design, why we do learning design. There are people that they do learning design because they want to do what they call epistemological and technological integrations by designers. Others because they want to devise new practices, plans, and activities, and resources, and tools. Others a bit more conceptual to create representations of teaching in the school sector, to design something that can be put in immediate use. That came from Zilli, and that's actually what it does, to design something, yeah? whatever comes out of that DDI. In order to provide program teams the space that came from us, is one of the definitions, and time to explicitly integrate practice tools, design expertise for the particular context. You will see a bit our difference. We are not interested in just doing a very, very quick change. We want to do a change that's going to have a sustainable, longer-term impact in the curriculum. So you may say that does not agree at all with what are the priorities here. You may want to do a lot of small changes across many curricula. Lock it in your principles and say, this is what we do when we do DDI. When things they don't work, 
is when you have different dynamics. And you will have one team that they want to do a quick one activity design in six hours, and another team that they want to develop a brand new program from scratch. And you plan these sessions to happen in the same day, and you, you don't know where to start. Either half of them are going to be totally out of their depth and bored, and the other half are going to need additional seven DDIs to work. It's not down to you. you. You have to tell through your directors and your, and your leaders that this is the approach that you want to take. Micro level, macro level, meso level, all three, but we need to know where we accept someone. And I intend, I, I'm very clear when I say, you accept people in the, in, in the carpet DM. It should not just be an ad hoc thing. Like you're standing here, this is a clinic, this, this is a, a support mechanism. You can do that if you wish. You can have a, a place where academics will come to get their fix quickly. It's a totally different thing from telling us you have to apply, give us a good reason as to why we should be doing design with you and investing all this amount of effort and time, given that uh, my understanding is that in this country as well as in Australia, you will need to have a report at the end. Your directors, they will need to go back and say, this is how we spend our resources and our money and our time. Yeah? To do that, you need to be absolutely clear. Otherwise, you cannot design this by having every random person jumping in and out a DDI session just to do a, a quiz or a thing. So sort it out. You might have all of this. And you say, this is a, a range of approaches that we use. But let me, the designer or the developer, tell you which one is more appropriate. And be absolutely honest. Any comments on that? How, how would you feel as academics if the center was telling you, you are not ready for this. You, you, you are not prepared and you are not committed. <laughs> Would you just say, I'm sorry, I, I'm not even interested. I'm not going to come ever back to you guys because you let me down. Because we face this risk, yeah? That you will be put so much like, oh, who are you going to tell me I cannot come to a DDI session? I want to come. I want to have my quiz and my thing ready. I'm just trying to also, and also I'm calling everybody to tell me the ethos in the university, how it works. The ad hoc knock on the door and individual consultation. Yes. We cannot show those individuals away because they are enthusiastic. Yes. They want to do something, and we have to deal with it, and that's pretty much going to carry on. Yes. But taking note that the amount of time and money spent on those modules will have to be managed in the future. Mm -hmm. um, they come to the offices and they want, you know, stars on the moon, and we can only supply them a street light, um, and that has to happen. Yes. The type of instructional design and intensive multimedia developments uh, used to be open for everyone, and yes. then they kick-start it, and then halfway they pull out, because they only then realize what the implications are. Uh, only some of them persist, and then the, it be, it's quite a painful experience on both sides, because it grows. It's yes. like, it, it just snowballs, and it never reaches a point of saturation and, and, and finalization. Uh, I'm going to stop that as well. Mm -hmm. We will not engage in this, this type of multimedia intensive um, acti activity, and we will only um, allow that for very selected mm -hmm. uh, components of really risk or threshold concepts okay. in modules. Okay. Um, we're going to generalize the multimedia skills uh, across the graphic artists so that they can help in the DDI process, whatever we're going to call it, mm -hmm. at the Carpe Diem stage to engage with lecturers as part of the overall commitment. Yeah. Um, but pretty much uh, um, we have lost many business, lots of business, yes. and have led to a uh, level of aggravation among lecturers because we do not have the resources to deal with yes. the demands required and we have end up with the mud in our face and do not think that if you ask for resources during budget rounds they would entertain that um, unfortunately there was a decision made that 
support services will not get any more staff up to a particular point. They think we are overstaffed. They do not realize we are overburdened. Mm. And we cannot uh, supply what we should. Yes. Um, so, you know, this whole episode that you've uh, shared with us, it's part of our history. And the Carpe Diem is, is, was an initiative yes. to deal with that. Unfortunately, we now have to move one step ahead right. and up the, the, the standards. And uh, the, the reporting to the government with grants actually dictates what, the, what this department does, largely so. And it's not necessarily always aligned with the strategic uh, plan of the university. Unfortunately, that's also a painful reality, but we have to deal with that. Uh-huh. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the, the resources are now distributed so sparsely across three directorates that there's no way in which we will be able to deal with this if we do not team up again. Yeah. And we, if we do not get the commitment of a faculty on specific programs to be prioritized, which was what we intended to do with the two programs, engineering and law, last year and for the next two years. But these two faculties will have to step up the game because they only go halfway and then, you know, they sit and wait. And we cannot assist them directly. They need to do the work. So there's a lot of porridge that drops on on the floor uh, between the table and the mouth. Um, That's an Afrikaans saying, uh, which I roughly translated, but the short and the sweet is we'll have to step up the game. Thank you. It's a reality that they will be faced by every university, what you just described. The fact that there are expectations upon centers like learning and teaching, but also designers and so on, to do more, if you want, focused work is something that I, I witness everywhere I go. People, they start realizing the fact that commitments and synergies between faculties, the centers, and the people is the only way to make things happen in a strategic way. So uh, my feeling is that models like the one that you will end up eventually putting up, there will be also another exemplar of what's going to happen in the sector. Because we realize that, that this kind of ad hoc support needs to be somehow systematized. I will give you two examples quite similar to what we just heard about buy-ins from faculties and how we negotiate it with them, whether we are up for a DDI or not. Yeah, sorry, yeah, um, Andre. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is uh, your unit is responsible for especially it has to do with the design of a, a new program. So what would be your take in a situation where separate units are responsible for macro and meso work mm-hmm. and a separate unit is responsible for a micro part of the responsibility? That's for... Especially for new programs. Okay. I mean, I'll just, new programs. I will tell you how our, our process of new programs works at Macquarie. Because also that will have a bit of a, it, it will get you to understand how the DDI worked for us and might not work for you or similar. So Macquarie is very much a devolved university. They prefer to give responsibilities of big decisions to the executive deans and their executive teams. In my capacity, now I, I was privileged because I was in both sides. I spent a lot of time of my life in the central team where I was being given a mandate by a dean to start a process like a DDI. And this is where the very first 2014 DDIs commenced. It was where a dean of medicine, they said, we already sorted out what the units and the things should kind of be named and outcomes. And what I w- we want from you now is to take the team, bring them together, and develop it. All the way to the DDI that I mentioned in the, in the report, where we were responsible in the faculty to make this kind of commitment. So the difference here is if you are approving on paper a new course or a new program, and you are putting the outcomes, the strategic direction of this program, and so on, at the faculty level, behind, well, almost closed doors, perhaps a team of the executives and one or two program directors, 
And then you take this final document that will look like a couple of pages of an approval into the committee that approves. You grant the approval, and then you start a learning design process. You are going to face totally different challenges. And there will be a different starting point and a different preparation that you have to do with these people. So we had this with our Doctor of Medicine. Okay, Doctor of Medicine, brand new program in our university, flagship program in our university, potentially the most expensive program I've seen in my life, money-wise. For someone to pay for this product, course, it was a very expensive. So the executive dean, we had a whole preparation only with executive primarily executive people, that they had this kind of big decisions, in order to sort out how it should look like in terms of priorities and principles. And then we said, now we need to get the buy-in from the people that would actually be delivering this thing, which is not the associate dean learning and teaching or the executive dean necessarily at the time. How do you go about it? We had to do almost a DDI to bring them up to speed with what has been agreed and what were the rationale, because there is nothing worse than getting into a DDI, not being clear which direction you are going. You are going to waste a lot, a lot, a lot of time. So if there is another department, so on the top of that, if there was also the vice chancellor's office that they have a view about it, we will say we will never, ever start a DDI unless you have sorted out your politics and your conflicts. The DDI is not about this kind of level of negotiation is about collaboration. And I'm absolutely clear there. We lost a DDI team in engineering, in mechanical engineering, primarily because we made the mistake to use our time to, to negotiate. We knew it because the mandate was like that. We have a bio, uh, biomolecular engineers and we have uh, chemistry, that at the moment they are different. We want to merge them. Okay, it was a political act. Can we use the DDI as a way for them to rethink the curriculum? And we said, yes, of course, yes. We will make them think how the synergies will happen. What we didn't account was actually there was not even a discussion to the staff about this merge. So they arrive in a DDI and the very first thing they hear is that they will merge as a department. And it was a disaster. You know, they spent three hours, four hours of the DDI, not even agreeing. Where, and we said, no, this could not be. So we, we lost half of them. And the other half, only the chemists, they continue and they complete it. So if there are, then there will be conflicts of interest. There will be politics. There might be even politics between an academic lecturer and the dean or the head of the department. So the academic lecturer was to take the direction of the course towards that within their academic freedom. But the head of the department actually is planning to delete the unit for next year. And, and the person does not know anything. It is part to our, to our DDI team to do this kind of if you want, investigation. So we can start with clear terms. There is nothing worse than starting with a conflict. I don't know if that answers a bit your, your question. But it's very important before you say yes, not to the, the ad hoc support that is very much important, as uh, our director mentioned. You will, do, you will have the individual who will come and tell you, I need some support. But that's not a DDI. The DDI is we are all on the same page that that thing should happen, how we can make it happen in the best possible way. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's extremely problematic in that case. So. You do DDI if you collaborate. You do DDI if you share. And you share ideas, you share templates, you share resources from across the disciplines and across the university. And you do DDI, very importantly, if you reuse. So things that you are doing and you are developing, they are not just things that you hold for yourself, but you are happy to reuse in a different unit and you are also happy to allow other people to reuse. One example for us will be in the, uh, and I mentioned it yesterday, in our indigenous team, indigenous education team, and they came as a team with the head of department being present, very good all together. 
they collaborated, they built the whole thing, they shared expertise, and then when the new curriculum um, strategy came in the university that talked about indigenous perspectives, they were committed to allow other departments use resources that they developed to infuse their curricula. I suppose for us to go down to medicine or go to engineering and start recreating indigenous things for them. Same if the doctor, Jewish doc people, the, the uh, lawyers have developed a very good guide of some sort about legal things and sociologists they want to use, the DDI methodology, and that is important to you guys because you know that last week you developed something for lawyers and then you hear that the doctors they want to do something else. Will you just say, let's go and design it? Or you will say, wait a minute, will that work for you? So on. So think of this, you know, you have to be aware that you are developing at all the different levels. So three very, very important things over there. So the whole process, part one, context and readiness. Primarily, this should take place at a higher level than you. Yeah? It should take place at the level of the course directors and, 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 and heads of departments, and definitely within the more strategic people across the university, that they will say whether they want to commit resources and time of their staff to support that initiative. Example one, we accept it. Bachelor of Clinical Science, Executive Dean calls for a DDI. We have a discussion over a period of time, and we understand that she wants to develop something unique, very intensive, very clear, very strategic, yet quite expensive. Before we said, yes, let's come in and do it, we had to clarify that whoever comes in in this kind of DDI sessions, they will have the time, the commitment, we're talking about medical doctors, we're talking about experts, expensive people with limited time. How can we make this happen? For a totally brand new risky idea for the university, an accelerated pre-medical program. But all the parameters, including the executive dean's authorization, was in place. We knew that we had full-on support. And as I said, engineering next door, discussion with the, the heads of the departments. We, we can feel the conflict. We can feel they were not really clear what they want to achieve out of the DDI. Unfortunately, at that time, we, say, we said yes. But after session one, the whole thing collapsed. And no one moved on. Go on. Yes. And yes. Good question. No way that yeah. I can actually do it. Yes. So the high level might commit, but it's practically not possible for the lecturers themselves mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. do it. So part of the readiness process, there will be a discussion that you have a strategic thing. It's down to us, the design team, to come uh, come with a kind of a pre-plan, almost to say we will expect to run four sessions of seven hours, eight hours with this type of people in the team. Can you please have the names of the people there? And can you please you know, have your promise that these people are going to be given a workload? Very honest. Sometimes they will say, and we had this with the medical, no, 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 this guy, you cannot have him for 20 hours. 20 hours out of clinic cost us a lot, a lot, a lot of money, and most importantly, cost the operation of the hospital. What can you do? Can we subsidize this person? I'm talk there are people, yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. Can I take out this big celebrity professor of the process and only use him for two hours when you need him to give feedback? Yes. You go into this kind of negotiation. We, and this has budget implications for the departments and the faculties, but that's how the DDI should work. Because otherwise, getting a team of people that they will come in day one and tell us, what do you want us to spend another seven hours next week? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not gonna, it will never work, it's not gonna work. Then you might say we're doing a carpe diem. Yeah, I'm not, what I'm, I'm trying to be clear here is I'm not saying you will 
get one or the other. More likely, you get something in the between or both in your own way. But be clear that this is the expectation. If you only come for seven hours, that's what we can deliver together. Absolutely clear. And that is the cost, the real cost, not the, the design cost around it. So there is, and I'm, I'm going to share the, the, the question. We do have a set of questions that we send to the people to think prior to this kind of context and readiness. But think of it like a mandate, a project mandate. Once someone, could be the program director, could be the associate dean, could be the executive dean, whoever is responsible for this complete picture, they look at what is required and they say, yes, I can commit my staff to this project. Off you go. Sometimes there might be money involved, sometimes not. Depends how you're going to do it. Make sense? Crystal clear. No surprises. We, we don't like surprises in that stage. Assuming that we do have, welcome. Join us. Guys, can I ask if the online participants are OK, following? Yes, no questions. All right, good, good. Assuming that this kind of mandate has been approved and the timeline has been discussed, then what they come in at the minimum is four sessions. So the DDI follows similar to the Carpe Diem methodology, like a session approach. Four sessions, we call them stages as opposed to steps, because there are stages that can be extended depending on uh, the needs of the team, if it is a program level or a course level followed by a number of consultations. And that is the third differentiation of the DDI to the Carpe Diem. The DDI allows this kind of consultation phase to take place in order to connect the gaps between the stages. Because stage one could be a nice visual representation with 25 questions. Can we do that? Do we have the resources? How much? So it's still on paper, but there's 20 questions. Before you come to the next stage, which will be actually the design of this, you need to have answers. You need to have negotiated. Perhaps you, you need to change your mind to some of these ideas. So we'll go and we'll do consultations. So four stages and practically four consultations and the readiness. That's the complete pack of a DDI. But the extent of the time for each of the stages depends on what is the task you are taking on, whether you're redesigning or you design from scratch a brand new thing from zero, from just one idea, or you are just doing an activity thing in the Carpe Diem session. The minimum thing that we ran was 16 hours, which is very much a Carpe Diem model, and we achieved eight activities. The maximum we ran was a full year, which was four two days sessions, eight days sessions and consultations, and we achieve a whole Bachelor of Clinical Science design. So, and that's in Macquarie time frames and, and complexities. Yeah, how it works. It was eight days, four. So always we try to have them in two days kind of slots, if possible, or half days one after the other. Because there's always, and that goes down to what we deliver, there's always a paperwork, and then there's always an implementation work. We cannot separate them. Because if we leave big distance between what has been agreed on the storyboard and what goes onto the Sakai or Isla or whatever system we do, we are facing problems there. Because you know, they, they accumulate. There's a lot of work to be done. And I'm going to give you a quick example immediately after we finish of something. I took it from a paper base, and we took it online. Stage one, at the moment, the way we, we, we have it is that uh, it's an opportunity. So you have all the teams there. Like, imagine yourself being a big team of academics ready to design the new law. And depending on what we know from the context and readiness, if you told us in the readiness stage that you do have a model, you have a particular way to want to do things, student center, problem-based learning, case-based learning, if you know what you're going to do, we will step in stage one and throw to you examples. 
So just to give you motivation, say, okay, you told us you want to do PBL, you want to do case-based learning, you want to do something. These are examples that we buy. So it's preparation on our part, the design team. This is how this could be. So we can influence a bit all the kind of delay, at the, you know, to warm them up. Because there's nothing worse than having people there with an empty black or white board asking them to come with ideas if they don't actually have any ideas. So go on. Contextualized. Are they based like already pre-engineered for the module specifically? The, uh, our view is that they are contextualized as much as they can. So they don't talk. So to give you an example, if the Jury's doc that you're going to be developing is for 800 students, and you give me an example from one that had 25 students, and you tell me how wonderful it was to design for 25 students in their activity, we'll avoid that. We're going to say, this is an example that meets the mandate. It might not be from this university. Most likely it won't be if it is only of its one of its kind. But it will be of similar type of, of uh, complexity. Because we get a lot of these people. Oh, of course, online discussions, yes. Oh, welcome message to everybody. Can you do that with a 1,000 students? Can we? Well, yes, there is an example that says how to do it. So we throw them a number of examples in that case. That's the scenario where we know what we are doing. If we don't know what we are doing, and it's open from just go there and talk at students all the way to do problem-based learning, we will spend time by introducing what we call pedagogical patterns. So show them that there is an opportunity for you to do this, and it's going to look a bit like that. Or you can do this model, or you can do this model. So throw them a bit of a vocabulary without expecting them that there will be expertise because we want them to describe it, but get to understand. Otherwise, it's getting a bit problematic to even get them at the right level of thinking. The most important thing of this session one is what we call think as designers. We are very much, we spend a lot of time, that could be almost like an hour, of showing them ready-made designs so they can see what they're going to be looking forward to and give them a bit of expectations that you are talking about some paperwork that's going to be lit little sticky papers you're going to be doing together. There are also some templates. And if we do our jobs correctly, you should, by end of day six, seven, eight, you should all have something like that. So now you are also a designer. You are an academic, but you are a designer with us because you are the person that's going to need to have questions. And these are the ways we work around. Make sense? Uh, think as the designers. I'm, I'm calling it now for you like that. I'm not going to tell them I'm going to make you designers. Yeah? And I'm not going there to say everybody. But I tell them we are in a partnership now. Now that we took you on and we are together, we are moving in on this kind of partnership. So let's design. You know, you can, you can look about design thinking, empathy. You are the most important people to us. We're going to look to you. We are customers. Try what be, it's the ethos of this university. In my university, the word customer is forbidden. I've been to universities and they just say, no, no, our students are customers, what the customer wants. And we'll play for that. Yeah, whatever works for you. But the idea is you are preparing the future of some people. Yeah? At, at the end of the day, be responsible. And then we do the learning design blueprint. And that's a template that starts with question, who is or who are your learners? That's the very, very, very first question we ask to them. So to, te to justify that we are talking about the same thing. Who are your learners? What will motivate them to engage in the thing you are about to design? And then there are sections in this blueprint in the, always in the form of questions, and that's another difference. We don't throw to them vocabulary. Yeah? We, ju we don't tell them, are you going to be constructivist or social constructivist? We just tell them, what motivates them to learn? If they tell them it will motivate them to learn if they memorize things, we might feel a bit shocked that people they believe still that the case we will not challenge them. We're going to say, all right, so you believe in memorization, and then it's down to your expertise to drive this word memorization into a positive and say, OK, yeah, we can, we, can, we can make them memorize. But tell me you're not going to do that by standing at them and talking. There are more powerful ways of 
you know, visualization is also very important to memorization. And you start playing with this kind of thing. So we spend actually stage one sorting out the parameters and everything for our design in this kind of thing. Go on. How about a situation where we are sitting with the lecturers coming with that questions? Okay. They are the ones saying, my students are not engaged. engaged. Yeah. What is it that I'm supposed to do for my students to engage? Okay. Which is the reverse of your situation mm -hmm. where you ask the questions and they are coming up with the ideas mm -hmm. of different ways yeah. to engage the students. In, s in our situation, we find the lecturers asking that question, expecting okay. the team to come up with ideas on how to yeah. get their and students will engaged. Come. It will come to that's good. That's a good question. If, can I just follow the resources to see if I have the template here? Which might be. So the template, maybe it's, I'll see what it is. The template which has the questions. Yes. So the program blueprint, which has the different questions, they sh we, before they ask their questions, we ask them to spend some time, that's part of the activity, to think about it in their own teams. Even if they have problems filling in this with plain words, then we can engage in a dialogue. So by doing that proactively, I've seen uh, 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 opportunities where you give this in before, and you tell them, come to session one, having at least some notes on that. That already preambles a bit, because it's not that they don't know what the problem is. They just want this kind of direct input. They are shy. They are worried that they, they might say ideas to you that they are old-fashioned or anything. So this template helps them put in perspective what the design will be about. And what I tell them at that stage is, don't worry. We write down all the questions that you have, and they will be addressed during the storyboarding. So you will get a lot of information. But at this stage, you and your students are important to us. We need to understand what do you think are the important things. So change the dialogue. It only takes a question back. Hold that question. It's good that you want ideas. I have a million ideas. I don't know if it's going to work for you. So before I bombard you, there's Big point, guys. Overwhelming our academics with things that A, they might not understand, B, they might even not, they think is the most stupid thing they had in their life, and not giving them space is problematic. I was in a situation where the poor academic wanted <laughs> just some support. Yeah, it was OK, the design. And we had a very passionate, and we still have a very passionate uh, people in. 3D, augmented reality, and they just wanted to, you know, to try out. But the academia, obviously, they kind of thought, oh, how can I move from having a book to having an augmented reality scenario? And is this the space now to plug the idea now? So we advised this, and that was important when I, I saw you the wiki. We kept notes. So when the feedback came, can we please take it one at a time? Can we be realistic? We achieved that. So this template is, not, is nothing new. Yeah? It is a set of questions that we thought are important for our university and our type. You can keep adding. So we, don't, we have learners, learning outcomes, environment, curriculum aspects, learning activities, all at very, very high level at this stage, just to see if they come with some ideas. They are not just there because they expect everything to be given to them. We had occasions that they just wrote one thing. Mm. Now, learning outcomes, most of the times, when they come to a DDI, the truth have been already negotiated and agreed. It's not the space to start doing this kind of political, into quotation, work. They should know what the learning outcomes are. They might be willing to accept some sort of a, um, discussion, comment. Maybe we can improve it. But it's not the space to go there and say, oh my god, your learning outcomes are not at postgraduate level. We should go and rewrite them. Because then you face this kind of, how am I going to do that? Oh, when is the next deadline? Oh, it's next year. OK, I'm not going to do a DDI then. <laughs> you know, you face this kind of complexities around it. So they do this kind of, of blueprint. And I advise that you devise something similar that meets your priorities. Go on. I've seen that 
just want to ask um, our two academics. I'm taking advantage of you two. Um, when you look at these questions a bit later during the workshop, after tea or whatever, um, because we found in some of our carpetems, lecturers struggle to think about this. They, they don't understand, you know, what's a teaching learning approach. So it's, it's difficult. And we also felt that, that that's important to, to get lecturers talking about that, rather than just to start with the design process. So um, if, if I can ask for some input, if you look at these questions, do you think it's important for lecturers to, to think about these kind of, of questions? You don't have to comment now uh, uh, yes. you, uh, in tea time. I'm just wanting your input because the, the lecturers need to answer th these kind of questions. Do you want to comment now or you are? Okay, for me, I for one, I think it is important to answer these questions because, like for example, I was looking at the first, um, the first question where you have to understand your learners and what can motivate them to engage with you. Because I mean, looking at looking at how how you plan your work and all that, it it, it wouldn't help to to deliver something where your students are not engaging with you so these are very important questions to actually answer as a lecturer so you need to know who your your, your learners are and how how well will you get the product at the end of the day so it is important i mean in, in one of the carpe diem booklets it might be the latest one there is a set of adjectives and, and de descriptions of what the course would look like. So I think Jill is talking about it's going to be an active, funny, modern course, playing a bit with a lot of adjectives, I think, if I'm right, which is good. What we felt, though, is, is it's perhaps more meaningful for us to come directly from the mouth of the academic. What will motivate your learners to be with you, whatever is there with you, the online, the face-to-face, -face, in the class? with your activities. And then we can agree whether it's going to be a modern, contemporary, creative approach. Naming it at the beginning and then trying to make it look like that, we found a bit of resistance from our academics. But this question one, it was the golden start for us. I, I'm still, I, I've done something like 18, 20 DDIs. I had no difficulty by not even, a, I, I need to stop the academics telling us what will motivate them. Not all of this, they will agree with what the, the, the theories of learning agree. You know, conservative academics, they will give you a lesson of why standing in front and having even a podium and being able to maintain an argument for 50 minutes with no stop is the most engaging thing. I'm not going to shut them down. Respect it. Let's keep it there and see how it plays with learners that you have in three campuses with online learners, with this, with this, with this, with this. And then they realize that their view only meets one particular group of students. So it's an important aspect. And I think find the questions that are important to you. I will add now, going back to that, are there any kind of uh, workload implications? So, you know, you can actually make it more robust and realistic if you want. But these things is in stage one. Duration. It will be anything between half a day, and half a day for us is a 9 to 12.30 kind of session, or a full day if you do have a big team. Yeah? If, you, if you end up having, for example, uh, 20 academics in the room to come through the whole of this and have this from diverse courses, not just one, you will need more time to, to pay attention to them. OK? Let's have a little break. And then I'm going to come. So this is pretty much all the setup for the DDI before we start doing the actual storyboarding, which I'm going to explain after we come back. Take 10 minutes. Yeah? 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. There's some coffee in the toilets, and that's fine. And our online people, yeah, find your coffees and your toilets.
Yes. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja. Absolut, ja. Okay, well, colleagues, welcome back. I hope you are refreshed, got some coffee. I can see coffee on the table. It's always good. Online virtual people, welcome back. I hope you're all here. We will continue now a bit with the DDI uh, process. And as I go through, again, filter it through your own needs, your own understandings. And I'm going to show you a number of templates that they can also become available to you. Open, Creative Commons, they can use them, change them, do whatever you want with them. But I will explain why they play a role in the DDI session as they do it. Now, if you remember, we said session one provides all this kind of uh, pedagogical uh, or adult learning approaches if they don't know them. Now, we made a decision across the university because we are a university that we strongly believe in what constructive alignment. I'm still defining a university, they don't believe in that, but anyway, they, we do have a sequence of, of uh, progression across the units. We have an a, the Australian Qualification Framework, the AQF, is being designed, is the guide that the accreditor, the government body, gives to the universities. And in this Australian qualification framework, I'm pretty sure you have something similar in every country, they do describe in quite detail what should be the difference between a bachelor degree year one, year two, year three, a certificate, a diploma, a master's, a PhD. In other words, they describe a quite sophisticated progression of activities and skills that students they should have. An example will be that a year one uh, introductory unit or module in modern history should aspire to provide foundational knowledge, expose students to some uh, first academic skills and so on, whereas a year three equivalent modern history unit or module should aspire to get students to synthesize and evaluate and do more advanced things. All the academics, they are aware of it, but they don't really have either because they never had the time to think about. So we thought we need some sort of a scaffolded framework to help them also 
follow on the top of the other things in the design this kind of sequence. So we can have a common language when they design a unit for level 1 or level 2 or level 3, we know what we're talking about. So we introduced a framework called the 3E framework. 3E stands for Enhance, Extend, Empower. It's a framework that's been developed up in Scotland around 2006, 7 by a good colleague of mine, Professor Keith Smythe, who is now in the University of the Highlands and the Islands, one of the biggest remote universities in Scotland for a lot of distance learners. The framework is simple enough for everybody to understand. I don't think I spoke to anyone they said, what do you mean? But it's a very useful guidance for the academics. In very simple terms, and I'm going to give you uh, an example. over here. There's a fully online resource around it. It's been developed for technology. We adopted it to become generic, not only for technology, but for any other skills or things you want to develop. But very much what they say is that there is a spectrum between enhance and empower, where you move from doing more introductory, simple, potentially monodimensional activities to extent where you add different skills on the top of the skills. I'm going to give a real example to see. And hopefully empower students themselves to be active users of this particular skill and even, even teach it to other students and so on. An example will be, and I will give you one from, um, let's say, I, I will give you one from medicine. So, in the medical curriculum, students, they need to take medical history. That's one of the given that the accreditation body wants. Every graduate of medicine and in other professions of health, they should be able to take an accurate, reliable medical history. And they have to do that repetitively. So one way of doing that will say, I'm going to keep this skill of medical history or outcome and demonstrate it across the whole of the curriculum only, let's say, at the enhanced level, which is always the students, they will observe someone doing it and then doing it themselves. Or always they're going to watch a video and then take a quiz. What this model says is, you could potentially introduce this skill into three different levels and essentially have the students moving away. So at enhanced level, the very basic level, it might be that the students, they observe a video of a good practice and a bad practice of taking medical history. Yeah, and they do that and then they write a little reflection or a little evaluation. In the second level, which is the extent, it could be that the students, they take part in a little simulation. So you have, let's say, a virtual character, or you might have a couple of scenarios, and the students, they go there, and they correct, and they play a role, they adopt a role, and they do different things. And then at the enhanced level, you might have the students acting in pairs of two, and taking medical history using the real instruments in a lab, one to, uh, to the other. So actually, they are empowered to put a use. So what we have achieved here is a sequence of students knowing what is good and bad, very theoretical, a sequence of playing in a very safe environment without being, you know, having any risk or anything until they master the skill, and only do it in real life at the enhanced level. You can do that across different units of study, module of studies, or you might want to do it across one particular unit, if it is one skill to introduce. Yes. The difference. So the extent scenario in the case that I gave you was that the student they still do not they are not empowered to do it in real life situation. They still they still try to do an activity in a simulated safe environment. 
Normally, the framework will say that the power level should push the barriers to real life application as much as you can. In a teaching context, like if you're training teachers, we almost do that anyway. You only send students into the schools and the practicums once they've done observations, once they've done mini sessions in the class that they witness it there, and then you put them into the live audience. Now, in a very more simplistic ways, the three can work in the, in the fact or in, in a way, for example, that you um, do collaboration. Just allow me to show you um, the framework in a more So, let's say that you're going to use the free E. If we believe that a lecture, the idea of running a lecture is still important, but you want to add a variation in this kind of experience to the students, what the free framework will say, and that's just an example, they will say that at the very basic level, you may want to provide some notes for students to explore and assist them with note taking which is very, very basic, and we do that. Not everybody does that in our university. A lot of the students, they come over, and they just listen to the lecture with no need to have any preparation. So the enhanced level here says, do an activity, add something there, that it will help them prepare for that lecture. Very basic, and they will recommend to do that in year one, session one. Now, if you want a slightly better use of the time of the students in the class in a lecture, you may want to have students to do a mini presentation. So you might actually want students to step in and do a little five, 10 minutes introduction to the lecture topic that will be presented for next year for, or for next term. And then at the empower level, in a way, it could be that the students themselves Instead of writing an essay, they actually write resources with the academics. So they provide the most up-to-date literature, they search the literature, and they write activities for the students for next year. They almost become experts in the topic. So that could be an ideal, for example, capstone, as we call it, which is kind of summative final year project. But gives you an idea, if you do have this kind of concept, any skill, communication skill, are you going to drop the students directly in year one in front of the thing to present? If you want to build the capacity for them to do it, what other activities can you do before that? You might actually simply introduce them to a couple of examples of presentations. You might just model yourself as an academic different ways. I remember like a very simple thing we've done in a DDI, academic totally committed to his 50 minutes lecture. The only thing he was managed to do as a change was at least to ask her to change the way that she was providing the lecture. So sometimes it was a lecture using a PowerPoint. Sometimes it was just a storytelling. Sometimes it was with a visiting lecturer. Sometimes it was a debate between the different people. But it was an achievement of moving away from just doing one way of lecturing to doing five types of lecturing which still enhances the learning, not with use of technology, nothing. It was just the way that she was describing it. Sometimes she had slides. Sometimes she only had the title of the slide and using the students to make, write the points back to them. So it was only when we introduced them to the three, because we believe, and you know, I'm not advocating that's the only model, but to us, seems to be working well, uh, that they start thinking. Tutorials. In our university, they are compulsory. So every student needs to come. But the way we run tutorials in our university, it's diverse. Some people, they treat the tutorial as a mini lecture. So the students, they come back and they are talked at. And then last minute, 10 minutes before, they might throw a case study. Others, they actually ask the students to do a lot of preparation, and the tutorial is an answer to a question. And other people, they have tutorials where groups, they teach other groups, and they become dynamic. Now, if you put this in a three spectrum, you might say the first is just the introduction, what the tutorial is. You might do it in year one. But in year three, all your tutorials will be more of that space. Make sense, the framework? So think of it, enhance, extend, and power. You might want to add another E, engage. I don't know, you can make it five E's, seven E's, whatever it is. But gives this notion that when you look at a DDI or Carpe Diem map, 
storyboard, and you and I'm showing you a real example, and you keep looking, quiz, 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 lecture, 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 monotonous, but this is the best you can do. You can seed the idea to them and say, all right, I caught the point, you want to quiz. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Let's accept that. Are there variations in your quiz? Can we have a quiz that will have some sort of scenarios as opposed to just multiple choice? Can we have this? Can we have the other? And they start reluctantly sometimes removing the quiz and then saying, okay, it's an online case study. And then removing this and go on. So having this, so the way we do it in the DDI, we prepare a little pack with this. So they already know our five, ten ideas that they exist in our university. We try to keep it local, to say, these are all happening in our university, which means if you decide to do any of those two, we have the expertise to support you. It's not just a superficial discussion. And normally it comes in a, yeah, like one, A4, and a map, three, and has extended power, and the activities. If through the DDI <coughs> there are activities that the academics they want to introduce, they are not part of our map, we add it and we say we can work together in the consultation because we don't have the time now to sort it out everything to go back. Make sense? So just keep it in your mind and it might be something you may want to work around. Session one is completed. The academics are gone back to their offices. What do they have? They have a program blueprint and they might have in this program blueprint a number of ideas around activities and things in a very, very vague way. And what they also have, hopefully, is one or two theoretical frameworks or approaches that they will keep them thinking. But they don't have anything locked down as this is the way to do things. And then there is a consultation going back to the DPI. So the first consultation is about contextualization. So we meet with them, ideally in teams, again, but it might be smaller teams or the most important. You cannot really host a big event again. But it will be like a team of three or four academics that they work in the same course to discuss together and see out of all these things that we discussed, which direction do you feel? Uh, oh, I look at my, can I borrow it for a sec? So I'm looking, I'm looking on my, what I said the curriculum should be. I went back and I, I totally think it's wrong. So I don't really want to do problem-based learning. I, I, you know, I, I read what you said. They, they have time to absorb the information. I went online. I looked more about what do you mean by case-based. I cannot do it. I don't have two hours of my life, blah, blah, blah. So they, they need to start revising this to the level that when they come to do the storyboard, they have a good idea about how it's going to map out. Because if we stop in every single thing in the storyboarding and spend half an hour to test whether it's doable or not, that will be the end of the storyboarding in, you know, you will achieve what? One week out of the 12 or 13 in that session. Keeping that the storyboarding will be a session on its own. Another five hours, six hours, how many? Okay? So treat this is a document that is being developed. And they are willing to make changes. And they arrive in the DDI session and they are surprised. Because they come here and some of them, they just do one module. Yeah, module we call it here. One module out of a whole program. But they arrive there and they've seen the whole program being mapped, that we've done it. So we ourselves have done a very mini version, either through a unit guide or something, and we tell them, welcome. Now imagine these little porters there being a, a, a map, and we say, you are number five in the sequence of this course. Your unit is unit X in session X in year two. So keep in mind, have a time, spend some time to think what happens before your time comes. Sometimes the very is okay? yeah. so sometimes is the very first time that these people they've seen their unit 
alongside the other units or modules alongside the other modules and it's eye-opening I shared with uh, the senior leadership yesterday the example of uh, a master in business in engineering high profile course expensive at the same time master's level the students that will pay a substantial amount of fees busy professionals all of them they had the good intention to do real cases and so on but they overdid it without without knowing it because everybody was closed in their own little world so everybody wanted to do a 5,000 watts case study and everybody wanted this to be submitted in week eight only when they saw oh you're doing academic literacy well, I've done it last week okay so it will be a petition here and, and then they go to the assessment they see the little assessments there and then we go together and we say uh, 40,000 words due in week eight for a busy person that will have no time to do anything oh you're doing case study yes and you're doing case study yes and what do you do I oh, will do very similar thing well the only thing that changes is the is the topic it's only then that they realize and becomes a very meaningful activity what can you take out of that to prepare for the case anyone prepares these people for case studies no you know we assume that they know well someone else will have done it so you and then all the three comes in place assuming that you need to prepare these people which unit will take the the load for preparation it will be the introduction potentially your activity needs to be a bit more down to earth you know more support less writing more examples less demonstrate less um, production and then hopefully they're going to move on and the DDI ended up in a, in a beautiful way in terms of actually very well balanced, very measurable, nice outcomes and everything. Okay, go on. I have a question. I just want to um, say that when Panos is referring to units, it's in our context we talk Sorry, about modules. modules yes. And a course means a whole program or a qualification. That's yes. just how the technology works for them. And, and a typical unit in our university in a normal condition will be 12 weeks of teaching, 13 weeks in total with the assessment. And a compressed version of it will be a six weeks. And sometimes we do have both. The same thing to be offered 12 weeks and six weeks, which makes the DDI also interesting because you have to compress all of this design in a six week period. And how are you going to go about? So when, when you were looking at that one is it will be at the particular level, maybe more like what he's referring that he did the model. It will be not that one yes yes so going back to the differences in terms of principles we do DDI when we always whatever we do even if we're just changing a single dot in a document and let's assume that that is a DDI worth time you make this change by knowing what impact has across the whole of the course the program we've been and, and that's very intentional and the reason behind it is some people they want to do the super wow important things in a totally inappropriate time for the students so introducing a super wow complicated activity that wants students to go out with our mobile phones and take photos and annotate and create things in week 11 in a course that has seven exams in week 13 simply will not work and you can understand why because no student will put the energy that you need you, you said they need four hours to go out I remember that from a building investigation so this academic what we wanted to do was replace a tutorial the tutorial was photographs of a building that was collapsing and then an investigation based on theories of whether this building you know is any way to, you need to demolish it or you need to renovate it came through a DDI and the idea came oh so I can actually now with the new mobile technologies that they measure uh, you know all this kind of uh, distances and they can put it in, have the level of dampness they can do a real investigation for free I said yes and the building next door which is the student union is absolutely perfect building to go and do it so she designed it and then she was very much oh the only time I can fit it is week 11 when she realized that week 11 is going to be 
pretty much the time that no one ever will turn up in the university for a start. They will not even come to the lecture because you're going to be in the library or somewhere else studying. We realize that this activity needs to be lightened up a bit. It doesn't need to have all this activity thing and introduce it perhaps in week three or week four or just leave it for the time being. So you see how big innovation that this guy had. That through the design, it was not appropriate. It was simply not appropriate. And she realized why. Or, if you want, you agree to take the risk. Run it, but don't expect anything. Activity in the Bachelor of Clinical Science that I designed personally, it was another way around. We used to have students going to the hospital. We have a brand new hospital attached to us, private hospital. And when we started, we had 60 students. So it was very easy for us to organize uh, an observation of a, of, a, of a room and how it's set up and all kind of the issues around hygiene, like very basic stuff. You know, when you enter a room in a hospital, you have to wash your hands, you have to do this, you have to observe. As the curriculum expanded, and that was a DDI session in 2014, but the activity, it was not viable in 2016. Why? Because you have tripled the amount of students. So an activity that was designed for 60 students, for 180, it was not viable because the hospital could not accommodate an additional 120 hours of visits of students. So what we agreed was, let's design a simulation. So we videoed everything. We asked our media graphic designers. They took accurate photographs of buildings. They annotated them, and they just went and they had a virtual observation in that case. But to do that, then we have to check at what point we're going to do it, what type of technology. So was it a discussion for a follow-up activity-based DDI? Yes. So we called the team back to do it. We chose the continuity yeah, of how things work. So they arrive into that session. And I think they do what you, are all, you already know that they do. And I'm going to put here the Let me see, session thing. Ah, by the way, there's a very good book, free book, called Technology Variety, Adding Some Tech Variety. It's not about technology. He calls it like that because he sells the books. It's actually activities. More than 100 different types of activities. Leia, I will now, I'll see if I can put it here, if it opens. OK? It's called Adding Some Tech Variety. 100 plus activities for motivating and retaining learners online. My argument is that is 100 plus activities for maintaining and retaining learners, full stop. And I use it like that. So we use the templates from that book because they are freely available. It's a, a professor from Indiana University, Professor Curtis Bong, which I met on a number of occasions. And he's actually, that's, that's his life. He just visits people and he develops resources. So I think he has something like 300 activities. Now, I say to the academics, you are lacking inspiration. Just browse. It's one activity per page. Quick idea. Online museum visits. Um, debates. Just name it. And then he gives you an idea of how long it takes that you can take part in your design. Okay? So that's an additional thing. You can take this, and then you can apply the three into that. So we do all of these things. So go on. Sorry to take you back. Um, I just want clarity on this. Yes. In the case where the request is to add a couple of um, activities yes. in a module or perhaps a unit, Yes. and when you work with the lecturers, especially at that stage where you have to show them all the units or modules within the program or a yes. course, and you discover that it's going to affect the other models within that course or yes. within that program. Do you invite all the other lecturers of the different units within the program to work with them no. so that we see where we tweak it? Do we really yeah. need to tweak that of the lecturers who are involved? Or maybe other lecturers or the other units might want to tweak theirs just so that there's consistency and the yes. flow is in order? Or do you just continue to work with the lecturers you're working with and just tell them, these changes are going to affect other models do you want to go ahead yeah. with it, or do you want okay. to leave it? 
good question. The answer, and it's a known and asked from the point of view that you commence the DDI knowing that you are doing it just to improve the particular units, I will just flag the issue with the academic and then with the course director, the program director, and they will have to go out in the consultation phase and sort it out for this. For you to intervene and say, I'll stop you, and I will call the other seven academics to come and change their boards, I'm not going to do it unless this was the mandate from the beginning, that we know already that we have to review everything in relation to that unit. So the, what I'm saying is that there is a, a work on your behalf, the designers, to know enough about the course that you are about to change and the module you are about to change. But by changing the model, to put, put it frankly, throughout the way, it's not going to work. So in that case, what I will do is, I will give you a, a real example again. We have a, an academic who wants to change um, that was law, Master of Laws. An academic wanted to change an online aspect that used to be there into a block delivery. So wanted to actually ask the students that they were coming to fly in over a long weekend and deliver everything that he was doing over a period of, of um, 12 weeks into that particular three days full face-to-face -face lecture. That was the odd out of the seminar. We took it on. We agreed how we can make it work in relation to the workload of the other people that they do online. But then we faced the difficulty that that particular weekend that he had in his mind to invite the students, it was also deadlines for numerous other online classes. I didn't call everybody in to come and say, I just flag it in. I send it to the course director, and I say, you need to make a decision whether you want to bring the team to discuss this big issue or not. And the answer I got back was work with the individual academic, resource it, but remove the deadline of that particular activity. And you have, he has to accommodate the other people. We are not willing to open up you know, a Pandora's box just for this particular thing. That would be a different discussion if the academic was saying that uh, if other two academics, they want to do the same thing. So we knew already that he wanted to do something different to something that was working well. And he came to a DDI unit, as we call it, which is DDI module, just to see how it fits. The difference between DDI and Carpe Diem is that, and again, I'm openly speaking here, maybe Gilly has developed this further. But my understanding of the methodology is that in that case, you will design it with this unit in mind. In our case, we'll say you are always part of the bigger sum. So let's see how you fit. They need to be aware, you need to be aware of the complexities. It's, 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 it's one of the rules of the DDI that you need always to, to look the big picture. But it's a very valid question. If something messes up everything, you may want to actually maybe take them to stage two, which is the storyboarding. And then in the consultation phase, you might have 20 difficult questions to answer. But you take it out of the DDI. Because you, don't, you cannot answer it on the spot. Me and you we cannot answer it. You need the input from another five people to do it. It's not wise to bring everybody in the room for all the sessions. It's not going to work. That's how we, we do it. So you made a note of that. It's good, free. Have a look. It doesn't cost you or the academics anything around it. Now, in the stage two, we have finalized this. So we spend a bit of time, maybe half an hour, just to see if there's anything left as a big question. And then they have this on hand, because it gives you the parameters of their design. And they also have. Uh, if you use sticky papers and things, that's normally how we do it. We use three types of coloring plus one for the difficult questions. So the three types of coloring are very much the carpet DM colors or the carpet DM ways. Activities, assessment, content, they go like that. But anything that has been think aloud, does not fit, is a random idea, crazy idea, 
our academics are very vocal and they will say, I wish I could do that, I wish, I know, I do, just write it down. Which brings me to the important thing, who is invited in a storyboarding activity? Yeah, how many people and what is the role of these people? Normally, you will have enough expertise in the room for the type of activity you want to design. Meaning that never, at least in my occasion, never in a storyboard activity, I needed the expertise of a media developer. Because it's a different thing for the educational developer to understand the need for a media product. And it's a different thing to discuss the logistics of the media product. So have, if I have a media, which are lovely people, yeah, and I, they will come and they will, they will come up and they will say, oh, it's going to be time consuming, cost effective, we, can, we don't have the expertise, all these kind of things. This will wait for the consultation phase. More of the time, what happens in a DDI, it will be, the question is like that. 80% of the speaking is the academic. Actually, 90% of the speaking is the academic. Your mouth is just questions. And playing a bit the, you know, like the devil's advocate. Oh, interesting. Are you going to do that? Have you thought about it? You just told me that. The question we start always is that. Think aloud and talk us through the student experience from day one to the finish of the, of the, of the module. And they will start and say, OK, yeah, uh, so week one, I'm going to have um, a lecture. That's typical. You have options. One is to go and say, oh, a lecture, is it not, you know, this is not good. Student, no. All right. So w w what exactly do you want to achieve? That would be your question to them. Oh, I just want to welcome them, and I'm going to give them some blah, blah, blah. And have you done this before? Yes, works OK. Yes, but I don't have the time. Oh. So is it, is it information, perhaps, that we can record so we can free time to take questions in the session? Can I do that? Yes. And at that time, you are confident that you can do this type of flow production. So automatically, the lecture becomes a pre-recorded lecture. Can I lock it down? Yes. So what actually now we'll do in your class? Oh, I'm going to give them a couple of examples, and I'm going to take questions. And at that point, you feel comfortable. You are not the one to judge. They might say, no, 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 I have to be there. I need to clarify it. I need to see their eyes. You know, I'm passionate about it. You're not going to fight that. But you will put it there. And what will happen after the lecture? Then normally I'm going to have a tutorial. That's kind of a typical standard Macquarie model. One to two hours lectures, two hours tutorials a week per, per module. What happens in the tutorial? This and this and this. And in the between, there is this kind of gap. And you just say, oh, are you willing to do something in the between to help them? Oh, yeah, yeah, I always have my PowerPoints online, and I have this, and I'm going to just replicate everything. And at that point, you are asking the questions. Is that, is that substantial? Does it work? Yeah, no, it doesn't work, but I don't have the time now to recreate this. But they might ask you do, you, do you have any ideas? And you say, oh, yeah, maybe what we can do is we can work together, and you can have all your PowerPoints convert it into kind of a big presentation that they can play, you know, on their, on their computers. So they don't need to keep downloading everything. And then they go there and you say, all right, what type of activities now do you want to run your tutorials? But they are all at a level that they are kind of non-threatening, to put it like that. So you are not telling them it's not good enough. Actually, you should never tell them this is not good enough. It's good enough if it's good enough. What you are there to say is to question whether this is going to work for 120 students plus 60 externals. Oh, really? Yeah, I forgot the 60 externals. Yeah, yeah, no, this is not going to work now. I need to take it away. Any advice? This is where you, you step in and you say, all right, I have a solution for you. Your tutorial could be done with this live lecturing, if you believe in that technology. So we can actually plan for this. And they go, and sticky papers, they go throughout, and so on. Now, different schools of thought, they will say, maybe you should start by the, having locked down the assessments. And I think this is what the carpet diem does. They lock assessments. What must be assessed? 
I'm not saying this good or bad, but the assessment, sometimes they're very, you know, like standard things. They throw essay, exam, thing, and then they walk backwards and makes it a bit monotonous. Whereas if you go like that, you tell them, oh, any of these activities, do you think this could be an assessment? Or what do you mean? Or maybe this video production, if instead of you doing it, ask the students to do it, you can throw a 20% to it. Oh, I never thought about this. That could be an assessment. And you help them a bit diversify and do these kind of activities. So you influence the storyboarding as they speak. But if you do it the DDI in the right way, your questions are 80, 90% of what comes out of your mouth. And another 10, 15 could be your suggestions. OK? Which goes a bit, I know we're all, you know, you have your expertise, you've seen things, you might actually bite in your lips and say, oh my god, here is the most boring thing I witness again, and I cannot stand it. But would you say that? I mean, the, the academic is with you. They are committing their time. They believe this is the best thing they can do. And at the end of the day, I, I, I am sometimes convinced. I, I was sharing the story with law, with a book. No matter how much innovation I was trying to throw, Thanos, they really need to read. If they don't have the book in their lives, they will never be able to do it. And I, I bought it in. I say, yes, keep it, throw readings at them. But give them something to, to play with, like something that they will keep the reading together. And it was a very, very basic design. Any questions? Go on. Um, maybe I, I want to ask again about the roles involved in, in yes. that storyboard session. So I, I just can get, did you say the multimedia or the media um, people sorry. should yeah. be or shouldn't be? I, yeah, I just sorry. Didn't get good, that. good point. So in the storyboarding activity, the first type of storyboarding, normally we will have the academics, how many of them they are, the coordinator of the DDI session, that normally is the person, the, the master of ceremonies, as we call them, the ones that they keeping an eye on everything, and two other people, academic or educational developers, the ones that they have substantial information to discuss the, the activities, but not necessarily the technicality of it, and a note taker. Someone who is their job is there to actively keep an eye on what is being developing and recording using this fourth color, which normally is a blue color for us, all the, the uh, questions, ideas for discussion, challenges, things that they need to be clarified for the consultation. Now, the note taker, it's not resourceful in a way. It's not, if it is an, a role on its own, meaning that you have someone just doing that all the time, I, I'm, I don't think any academic director of a center will employ someone to be a note taker. Yeah, it's not. So it could be negotiable between the educational designers and developers. It's not, a, to me, it's one of the most important roles. It's not someone that is, you know, um, underrepresented their skills, but you need someone there to do it. And the reason you have to do it is, after the DDI event has been converted from a storyboard to something that you give to the academics for the consultation, you need to have recorded all the gray areas for discussion. And if, the, if one person is thinking creatively all the time, the other person is questioning creatively all the time, you need someone to say, I witness that they are not doing, they are totally all over the place, these guys. So you put there and you say, I, I witness a lot of disagreement. You know, you may agree, but I'm not convinced that this activity is what the academic wants. They, are, they still have five questions around this activity. It sounds time consuming, it's not. It's, it happens very, very organically. Uh, it's only having someone to observe and take notes. It could be a, a designer, it could be a member of the academic team that perhaps, and this is where it would be good maybe to have some other academics involved that they may don't do the DDI themselves, but they are observing the DDI keeping in mind that maybe they will do a DDI later on. And we do now have a little group of, uh, we don't call them DDI fellows, but there are people they've done it, and they're willing to come and help us and, and, and do. Sometimes we invite them as guest speakers to enthuse the others, and they become note takers. Just 
just more uh, because it seems to me the storyboard or the the session two it's it's much like our current carpe diem yes. but um the way we do it we used to have um say for instance four modules four tables yes and then each table we try to have an educational developer as you call it we would like an instructional designer and then we also try to include a media or an e-learning somebody that's got that uh, technology technological yes. aspect expertise so um and then we have one or two academics yes so that's how we currently doing but we we've realized that that's a very um, resourceful for for, every, for four modules. There's three CTL mm. uh, stuff, mm. and it's 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 very re t time consuming. So mm. d if you say that those roles, do you mean um, they involved in, in in a session, but for for all the units? They, so the we ma the expertise of particular people is being used normally in session three. So session three is when the, and, uh, so we will bring a media expert to give us advice on the production of this media after we have done the storyboarding and we know that there is a need for media and after the consultation. Assuming that the educational or academic developer, they have enough information of the, of the capacity. So for example, they may already agree as a team that we cannot tolerate 12 modules having 12 videos each week. So the mandate is that you need to do it like that. But it's not the point of the DDI now, and we've seen examples of not working well, to then, because the media people, they are lovely, and they talk from their expertise. They will speak their own jargon, and the, and the academic will listen there and say, oh, you can do a documentary, and you can use, don't use flash, don't you do, they, they throw them a number of technicalities, that they are not ready to absorb. What they want to know is, can I have an introductory video? If you tell them the answer is yes, we lock it, and in the next session, when we already decided who is doing what, we invite the people to give the expertise. And this is where you're going to say, actually, you don't even need a media designer. You just need a good mobile phone and your voice. Because the intro we agree that the introduction will be self-recorded. And in that case, Having the media people there, they're going to look around and say, why? If you have this in your design, virtual live streaming, you have it there. You know as an academic advisor that can work. You might need to sort out the detail of it. That will happen in session three. Okay. That's how we do it. Go on. That's the role of our, the few of us that's instructional designers because yes. we both in the educational and in the um, media uh, yes. and the technology and we know uh, and work very closely with the media team. Yes. So we will be able to say and know if Something what's being is, yeah. suggested is, uh, is feasible or not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely. That's why I said you need to have the idea of a learning designer in the way that we use it in the DDI, means that you do have an awareness of all of these things. So you're not going to throw, but you don't have the detail expertise. So it's the media, an example would be the media advisor will tell us that this thing needs to be done in a screen studio, high quality thing, because it's very difficult to be captured in any kind of free tools. And this advice, we only need it once we agree there's going to be a media production. If that's what I'm trying to separate, there is a level of detail that is not needed and actually diverts the DDI in session two, stage two, from that if you just lock down the complexity of a media production. Even worst augmented realities and 3Ds, you know, they are good to be there as ideas, but how are they going to be implemented? Actually, they might decide that they don't need it anymore after they've done the iteration. And it's, it's, I've seen people sometimes in a DDI doing nothing, like, like sitting there and looking. They're not interested in take notes. They're not you can actually have, that's an idea, having a media person performing the role of the note taker. And in the same way, they are also become aware of what is happening. And they can also make notes on the spot. 
So we can be creatively, but having five paid designers, developers, media from a team of 50 or 60 towards one or two academics in each session, I'm telling the truth now. I'm about to design the BA with 60 majors. That will be 60 DDIs of teams of eight. Yeah? And that's only one of the many things you have to do in a DDI. I cannot afford throwing five people in each of the sessions. I don't have them. It's so simple. So you have to be very creative who is performing the role. So we are talking more about functions of these people and then the expertise. And the fine line between a media producer who is well in form of theory an educational designer who is also, because they know, experts in media. I'm not saying don't do it, but be very careful how you use them. Because the media expert might be needed to keep producing the outcomes of the previous DDI, not keep going on DDIs. That's not their life. Li librarians. I mean, Gilly's uh, model, and I've seen it, she calls librarians in many times because there is a need to discuss resources, which is great. You do it in a particular time. OK? Relatively clear of what's happening? Now, as you mentioned, what is the output of that session? Going back to the OK, going back to the thing. Looks a bit like that, a typical EDI. I think looks like what you do. OK? So that's me. I'm just describing the role so you can see what's happening in that space, if that goes. That's the key stakeholder, our academic, who is also the head of department in that case. Next to him is myself as the assigned educational expert for the particular session. On the left is our note taker, who at the time was an educational designer, who was observing what we were discussing and taking the notes and making. And on the back, it was just another academic that he was to co-teach that unit. So that was one DDI. And there was like five stations of other academics around of different, different modules and different courses, different programs as well. So next will be a station for the indigenous people that they were doing a part of the DDI and so on. So over here, the difference here was that this guy was prototyping a model for a module that then he would like to put to a big DDI. So, and I'm going to come now to the other difference, that there is no one DDI. We have four DDIs, four models. This is not one. So this guy said, I want to do a DDI module, or unit as we call it. And once I'm happy that this thing is sustainable and w can work, I will call all my team, and I will do a big DDI. But before that, I want to convince myself that this thing is, because he was also the head of department, is doable, and I will play a video. Next door, I think. It was a team. So over here. We had lawyers, media people, library people, and they were all coming to design one of seven. So there were like seven little sticky papers, uh, like uh, whiteboards, all for the same program. And the team was rotating around and looking to see the connections. OK? So you will see how that worked. Still with one crew team. I didn't have five designers or seven designers. It was still one, but their job had, it was a bit bigger. They have to keep going to move faster. But the outcome of this design was at a higher level than the outcome of the other design. So the guy that he was doing the unit level, 
he managed to identify every single detail of his unit to his satisfaction as a proof of concept. The other guys, they've done seven kind of little prototypes that they still needed a lot of extra work to come back and design it. And that is reality. You cannot promise the same thing to a team of seven and the same thing to one if you provide exactly identical resources. Logistics, they won't work. Okay? That's why we go, went back to the university and say, DDI, yes, for, mod for models. DDI program, which is the model which we use when, sorry, DDI new program, where everything is brand new. Okay? So someone, a new lecturer or someone, comes to you and says, I want to design the new Juris Doc program, the new Master of Laws, the new physiotherapy degree. You go through the consultations, you know, this kind of readiness. Yes, it's approved. You like it, whatever it is. What is the team? Seven academics, eight academics. Or I don't really have a team yet. Very, very typical at Macquarie. I have to design it, and I'm going to hire the people to teach it. Yeah? So you take other type of risks there. Because then you need to bring the people in the team to do it. But that's the big thing. I have still to see... We've done roughly eight brand new courses, including some of our flagship, in that methodology. Minimum amount of time we spent for the consultations and things was this eight full days, plus across a year, plus the production time. That if you see the document of the timings, you will see how much it takes to do it. And you have to be very strategic. Still, you are using very similar templates, but you, the storyboard is much more superficial. So the difference between a storyboard and a new program will be topic 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, activity 1, interactive, and so on. It's a, it's a, a skeleton because you cannot really put the content. You are not the expert, but you are the associate in learning and teaching, and they are the academics that you already have some expertise, and they say, this is a good model. And then when we are ready, we will call a DDI unit or UDI module to plug, to fill in the gaps of this. So DDI new program, and then we have DDI programs where what we do is we renovate a whole program of study, but an existing program that has history and has documentation and resources already. And that's not a, a tabula rasa. It's not a, a blue sky, as some people think. So if you take a Jewish doc that already exists, but exists with difficulties, and you want to take it to the, let's say, the innovative Jewish doc, you already have learning outcomes, and you have things that they are agreed, and perhaps they don't need to be changed. And then you just call the program teams with already having all this documentation in place. So in that case, when we, they arrive in that DDI, they have semi-completed um, templates of what already exists. So they can kick off with the changes they want to make. So two at the course level, a degree level, as you call it here. And then there's two models at the module level. One is brand new module within an existing program, OK? So you realize that you just lack a unit on physiology for something. You never had it, brand new. I need to see how it fits in a sequence of all the other units or modules I have. That will be one that they will come back still having all the documentation of what the other the units do. And the final one is the Carpe Diem, which is existing module in an existing program or many existing units or modules in an existing program that you just want to make a number of small potentially changes. A typical example for us will be the whole of the faculty wants to infuse the curriculum with indigenous perspectives. How do we do it? We call a DDI unit or 
the DI module, as potentially you might call it. They already have the storyboard half developed. Actually, they have them fully developed because they exist. And you look at them and you say, where about I'm going to start? It's a different conversation. Where is the best place to infuse the curriculum? The, I'm going to, so, oh, I have an activity like that. I can do. My content can, and then you start doing these kind of changes. Very rapid, within a day and a half, you are done, roughly, to speak, in, in that kind of case. But we realize this the wrong way. You know, like we have to go through getting people that they want to do the big DDI, assuming they want to do small changes, and any time they have to rewrite the curriculum. So we calculated everything, we go, and then we arrive with these kind of four modules. Important thing, though, what is left out of session three? Okay, it's something like that. Okay. So if we do our job correctly, at the end of stage two, our academics, they are left with something like that. In our case, you can see here 12 weeks. They represent the 12 weeks. They have their notes, for example, welcomes, the Anzac legends, uh, then I want a group activity, then I want a topic called Frontier of Wars, a quiz, a debate, the birth of Anzacs, quicks too, role play simulation. We have this thing. It's vague from a designer's and you tell me guys' point of view is hungry and intensive. Simulations, debates all over the place. Really, 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 really intensive thing. What do you do? So what, what would you do with that in your carpe diem once you reach that point? set up an action plan okay so you would say in order for this to happen who would be who would you need to assist you and what's the timings of that so uh -huh. that is usually how we end our carpe diem is with an action plan okay. although the process ex expects us to do the prototyping and everything okay. but we usually not don't get to that stage so after this we we do an action plan and then we leave the lectures and then if your name was on that list or on that action plan, you will respond and, and do your part. But the lecturer has got um, now the responsibility to, to, to get that happen, so, or to, to, to develop that quiz, or to go and see somebody to help him do the video, or okay. finding the resources to uh, consult with the library if it's mm -hmm. needed to get some resources, etc. All right, thank you. How would the, lect how the lecturers feel about so what, what you would expect to happen after you reach that stage? What I'm trying to say is, would you be comfortable now to say, all right, off I'm going to go now, for example, and start plugging my quizzes or working in that kind of theme? Or do you, you want a more? Um, let's say, another session that you can work with a designer. And I'll come back to that. Sorry. On paper, the plan, On paper, the plan was that two weeks after the Carpe Diem, mm -hmm. there's a, you enter the stage of a development. Yes. Uh, and that those who participate, who have committed and were contracted at in that action plan mm -hmm. to sit down with these lecturers and do this now <clears throat> that is where lecturers need to dedicate full time mm -hmm. and the designers have to be there and available and sit with them and work and sometimes there's a break and then they come back um, but that is what was planned on paper what panned out in the reality is after carpe diem bye bye uh, I now have to follow up with all the course directors to get this up and running again because yes. nothing is happening and our staff is not occupied and we need to rectify that. S the idea was to buy out the time of yes. these lecturers with grants. We offered it to them. There was no take-up. Okay. 
Thank you. Would you like to comment? Or someone? You're okay, guys. All right. I'm, I'm not saying. I'm just saying that I'm going to tell you now the, the failing story and the success story that I promised at the beginning. Because this is the easy stuff. To come to that level almost is, is pleasant and natural most of the times. But, like theory, as you know, is, is always better than practice. It's when you reach that level that we faced academics that they will say, now I expect this to be developed for me. And they were very honest with that, that we have no expertise and no appetite to do any of these activities. We can help you with resources and we can give you content, but we cannot really go in there. And we need to work with you intensively. And we had academics that they will say, thank you. I want to use this and I'm going to uh, think about it. And then at some point, using an action plan, I might come back to you. In the first instance, if this scenario exists, it's because we agreed on that. So in medicine, we said that we will produce things with you, providing maybe 60% of the support, whatever. But this will happen in our terms, meaning, not to be misunderstood, that you have you are still in a DDI process. The DDI is not completed, which means, going back to the DDI, there is a consultation to Oops, sorry. over here, consultation two, that takes the storyboard, and that's the responsibility of the local team, you. They take the storyboard. Normally, we put it in a Word document of some sort with our notes of things that they are doable and things that they are difficult and time expectations. So for this academic that you just seen, we say to, f to do that in the production time, it will cost us X amount of hours. And out of this, we can only resource this. We can help you do six quizzes and three videos. The rest is something different. So we take the action planning that Jilly and the team recommends to the reality check together. Action plan and reality checks happen together. We agreed that we need this and this and this and this. In reality, and this is what uh, it was just mentioned. You face all the uh, pushback from the academics and so on. Because I'm going to say, I cannot have the time. I, don't, I never had this opportunity. But we agree that if you're going to commit yourself to that action plan, you continue the DDI. So you come back for a consultation, and then you come back for a production day. So our stage three is production. And the production is very simple. We believe we are the most experts to set up uh, an online space to our standards within 10 minutes. If I don't know in the university you have a template in your Sakai, do you use any templates? How they look? Yeah? So having a standard look and feel of an island, we call it island, that's Moodle for us, it's actually something that we can achieve in five minutes compared to five hours that an average academic to find the motivation to go and do it. Yeah? Why to torture them with that thing? So we say, don't worry about this. We will provide the skeleton of what it is there. So there will be a banner that says, welcome. But the welcome, we have to write it together. There will be activity one space. And based on what you told me, that's a quiz. They will be plugged you for you, but you have to click the button and create a quiz. So they will come back in session in stage three, and they will see the production thing, excluding the high-end productions, the videos, the fully other things that then you have to make arrangements with the designers. But they will spend, believe me, spending five hours just doing basic ads of web links, things in the team, you achieve a lot 
but they come already, normally they give a USB, they bring all their PowerPoints, they bring anything that they have produced, even in a skeleton format, already. The philosophy behind it is that motivation is when they see things happening, they are motivated. It's, it's crossing that barrier of paper and, my God, I need to go into the space and do it. And some of them are better than others. But we absorb this responsibility. And we say that for you, because we are following a template approach, and I highly recommend it, although I believe there is individual, uh, you know, you can give a bit of different feeling. You can do your own banner, put a couple of photos, you can cosmetically, but everybody will have a sequence of events in the way it's going to run. It works very well. I don't know, I'm just leaving it as an idea, but you can achieve much more by bringing them back in another session, which can be called the production session. You will achieve maybe 60 or 70 percent of the production on the day, and you will have the very difficult, uh, expensive artifacts to be produced as stand-on. So there will be a video folder, and there will be an action plan that says, I, actually, there will be a booking already. There will be, I booked Panos and you, and you have to have your narrative ready for Friday afternoon. And that's because how we work. If you don't do it, then you do it yourself. There's no capacity. That's why I go back to, there is a limit of how many DDIs we can do and what types of DDIs we can do within a semester or a year. Yeah? Because I, I will never accommodate in a DDI someone who comes just to do one quick ad hoc thing. I will do it in a clinic, in a two-hour seminar that I run on a different type of session. You see the difference here? So with this guy, we moved from, uh, let go back to that. We moved from that to that. So this was his storyboard, wherever it was. A welcome, the different videos. And that is what he saw. So when he arrived in the DDI production, we already had set up the title, uh, MHIS 205, Australians at War. We had already created the, the banner, not for him, but he said he wants a banner that looks a bit military, and we discussed it, and we did it for him. There was an introduction, and he already told us that the introduction will be two video clips. So we set up that, okay, it's going to be clip one and clip two. They're not produced, but you know by visiting that this is a commitment. There's a unit requirements, there's a unit guide, you know, all this kind of stuff. that we. These are standard for the university, so we plug it in for him. You cannot not have a unit guide. You cannot not have news forum. You cannot not have these informations. So these are pre-populated. Then this was just a space for him to put his assessments. And then following his approach, we set up what he was talking about. Building knowledge was called in the title, we replicated. And then there was things that they would have to develop. But that provided, if you want, not an action plan, but a real, like a work in progress. It's, it's a slight different thing between a verbal promise that's going to be a work in progress and something that you can see is happening. Now, if they decide to abandon this thing and we had opportunities where they just gave up, it's at their own risk. But they know that this thing will go live. This is the real thing that go live to students in three months' time, four months' time, a year's time. So we are working from a demonstration thing. OK? So that what came from the literature, it was exactly that. Our academics, they feel that the design outcome should be something more than a storyboard. And we don't have methodologies yet that they calculate all the complexities of agreeing the parameters to move away from that to the production in a sustainable way. So the way we are doing it is if you do a DDI, you commit to a third session, that's production, and to a fourth session, which is review. Okay. And this is now where you have the ability to spread this according 
to the demands. So this guy, heavily media. The difference between production and review could be five months. Yeah? But we knew already that between these five months, there will be five productions on these particular weeks or dates. And then there's going to be a review that takes place. And they know that they have to plan ahead. Go on. Questions? Uh, my question's actually sort of been answered regarding the review. Yes. Because we actually also have a consultation, depending on whether you use it or whether the lecturer can come, can come to the table. We've got a session where we do this. Yes. Some of us. Yes. Where we do this. We leave the spaces and everything. But then it still needs to be... Um, in that review process, yes. if that has not been done, the agreement from the beginning, that, that initial agreement, how does one, um, from faculty side probably then, then enforce this, or from management side, make sure that the process is being completed? I assume that you're still going to come to this in terms of the report that is being written yep. and how to follow up, because yep. that is, it's actually waste for resources if the lecturer doesn't complete the whole process Absolutely. then. Absolutely, yeah. So we are, reporting is an ongoing process of the DDI. So that's why we keep the wiki. So we report every single outcome. And what you saw here, which is the final report, which is what did we achieve? Very detailed over here. With whom and how many hours and everything. This will come to the faculties, relevant associate dean. It will be discussed at the forum. And that is non-negotiable. That's not negotiable. It will have to come to a quality and standards thing. We have a form that we are using in our review. Which is a quality rubric. Which we conduct about things that they should be in the design that we have seen. So we do all of this, and then a report goes, and it's completed. Now, now we are fighting two things there. One is the, the compliance and the bureaucratic aspect that can really, really put people off. Another is the innovative thing. If you are, though, clear from the beginning that this job is we absorb this job. OK? So we are responsible to go to our director, because our director, in my case now is the executive, needs to go and say that we renovated or we created five new units at the cost of $120,000 and out of workload X. Can we do that now for the 50 units we want to do next time? They want this information. And it has to be, we are accountable for that. Uh, again, the ethos of the DDI to the Carpe Diem is that the DDI is owned by the university, is, in a, is a process that the university buys in, and either you do it and you do it the way that, or you are out. And we, we have the thing to say, I'm sorry, we cannot work with you. You miss your deadline. It's not that I'm not supporting you. I'm not going to complete the DDI with you. So if there are things for you to do. You can still come and get support for your media. But please go out of the DDI thing in the other vehicle of consultation. Talk to the media and do it. But if you do a DDI, you are not over when you do a design. You are over once you've done a review and a report like that has been produced to our satisfaction. Our ne newest thinking is it should be over after the first evaluation of our students comes in, which brings us to the thinking of calling it DDIE, including the evaluation, because that's a gap at the moment. We've done all of these things, all these things. We do collect the information. But it's not forming part of a documentation. But it will be even better if you say all of these things has been done and it's working. Now, the university, and I'm stopping here for other questions, is introducing, as we speak, a curriculum life cycle. And that is a life cycle where formally everything has to be reviewed. So we are now looking in this life cycle what type of DDI can be triggered as a result of this process. And we are in this kind, it's not formal yet, but I'm going to tell you what we are recommending. If a unit or a module in your case is keep getting bad reviews as we speak, it, it will be a complied trigger 
from the associate in quality for this person to go to a DDI unit. No negotiable. You have to come and do it. We are not risking our students complaining that everything is not working because you don't have resources and so on. You'll have to come back and do it. If the, the trigger says that the program is out of date, that will be a trigger for a DDI program. And that is a way not to be burned by having everybody coming at once. So if it is an academic life cycle, means that once a DDI, and that is true for that, this thing will not be touched for roughly the duration of the course, which is around three years, or one year if it is a master. After that and after the iterations, we can rethink of another DDI. Because some people just love to come and keep doing DDIs. So the DDI will be open now in a more systematic way. The university will say, we will introduce new courses only in this period of time. So the time that this DDI will run is, let's say, every February each year. We try to put it in an academic calendar. Because there is nothing worse as doing something like that. And then they will say, thank you very much for the 120 hours. By the way, we're deleting this course from 2021. <laughs> so what did we achieve? Maybe we educated a bit the academics to do it right. You cannot imagine the, how they feel. No, you could imagine how they feel. But if it is an academic cycle that says this course is not going to be deleted in the next three years because its time has not become, it makes our life much more easier for that. Sum up and other questions. To do a DDI, you collaborate. To do a DDI, you have principles around agreements and buy-in at different levels. You have four stages that they take people all the way to production, including the action planning. And you do have, that's why the note taker is important, I'm going back. You go, you have, rep you have reporting mechanisms. The carpet diems, you know, they just leave you with a nice little blueprints and stuff. But you have a role to play of translating these blueprints and, and sticky papers to something that looks like a curriculum. And the academics, they will not do it themselves. They want you to play back to them what is substantial. To say that, you cannot do 100 DDIs in six months. No, you cannot do it. I'm supposed to do 70 DDIs in this coming year. We are looking for ways to economize it. Groupings, as much as possible, so they can happen. Seven zero. Seven zero. I mean, we've done 50 DDIs in the last year to renovate, as we call them, our online offerings full following this methodology. But we've done it in groupings of 10, so the 10 most relevant. So what I'm trying to say, the methodology is there. It's your way of thinking, your calendars, your policies and methodologies that they will glue everything together and your resources, how many people you had. Any other questions or comments? John? One symbol away from Eddie. Was that there? One symbol so away from, from Eddie. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Eddie. He will put there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the process is exactly the same. Yes. Other comments or observations? Maybe just an observation in advance uh, or out of, out of place. But I would expect that if we move in this direction, the multiple table configuration in a Carpe Diem will still apply because we have numbers against us mm -hmm. and time against us. Yes. But the push backwards in terms of strategic commitment and the actual implementation of that commitment and a, a, a yes. complete rollout would be the value add yes. um, to what we have. Absolutely. And, and we've, um, to an extent, in, in some cases to a lesser and in some cases to a larger extent, have dealt with some of these issues. So I'm not saying that we have missed the plot completely, 
but the strategic commitment, the link to the quality review cycle, three years, five years per program, uh, shelf life, um, and and the leaderships yes. uh, buy-in completely. That is what, what is seriously lacking at this stage. Um, I've dealt with the commitment or the, the uh, rollout at the yes. development resource restricted uh, yes. phase already. But I, I think it's possible to do this and I do think that we have to play the multiplication role because uh -huh. uh, we can't deal with it in any other way. We have three years to do certain things, yes, uh, governmental grants, mm. but we also have how many programs running at this university? I wouldn't know, 800? plus minus 600 yes. uh, that we have to uh, get sorted out within five to, eight. well, at least within five years. Yes. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. We've dealt, started dealing with two of those. We're not going to hit the target if we carry on the way that we do. Absolutely. I, I think I agree absolutely with the observation that the, the added value of what you do in terms of the storyboarding is a common thing across any methodology I've seen. What is important for universities to understand is that the realities of university administration and, and the way that operates, they call for some more realistic paradigms. And that's what we try to achieve here. Like honest buy-in and, and respect. Because there's nothing more. An academic will feel empowered, to put it simply, to come to a DDI if they know that all the people at the, on the high end, they respect exactly why they are doing it, and they will be backing them up. Yeah? And you also, you're going to feel that you're not wasting your time by designing something that tomorrow someone will click delete in a system and get rid of it. You have to have an, an, a security about these things. Academic life cycles are getting more and more popular. Actually, they are getting demanding. Now, governments, they demand stability of curricula which goes a bit uh, stability and agility. Yeah? So that's why four models of DDI, they play a bit in the agility space. Like we, we do have a model that is quick, that we can do this kind of little changes. But we have to keep the big picture. So there's a few questions there. Um, I'm, I'm part of the multimedia design team, yes. so I'm inter interested in um, session three, yes. where it says building the prototype. Is that the, the skeleton yes. on the whole skeleton? It's not one activity. It's the whole skeleton it's on the whole, LMS. Yes, yes. So normally what we want to see, when we see a prototype, we want to see the skeleton of the complete thing with all the, the spaces, folders, descriptions and as much of other things that we can do. The, the, the minimum will be linking resources to things that are already happening, putting up PDFs or anything. And then from the media production, it might be that perhaps between session two and session three, you might have prototyped for us like one minute video of an introduction of how it's going to look like. So then we can say we're going to replicate this 10 times. And I measure that and cost me, I don't know, 25 minutes each. So, f and this is where the designer's expertise comes really in session three. And they will come, stage three, they will come and tell us this thing, the action plan that you develop over there goes out of the window. I need 10 times more. Um, so, um, in terms of media production, yes. I hear from you, um, LMS designers, as well as video production. Production. Because yes. we, we are a team of people who work in articulate storyline. I'm not sure if you're yeah, familiar yeah, yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. Do you, at, what, at what extent do you incorporate that um, level of development in the yeah, yeah, DDI? Yeah. It's so, it, it, so, to give you an example, if I, can, I might be able to show you. If we go now, I will just show an example from um, public health, which is heavy on media. So that's a fully, oops, I'm out. That's a fully DDI uh, unit.
hopefully that should work now. So that's uh, public health. Where, for example, they wanted to start with an introduction video. In the original plan, they had a, a, an animation. So they wanted an animation. They said, can we have an animated infographic which will show all the different aspects of public health, almost like a concept map. They described it really well. And I think there is a template here that is called the DDI mapping PLO with units that says, give me the, the activity you want to do. Give me what is the learning approach you want to take. Give me which tool you want to use. And then rate how important is this combination to take place. So these guys, they put there and they put infographic. But pretty much what they wanted at that stage was a video that quickly captures the, uh, the essence of what public health is. We identified that to produce this video will cost us, and that with expertise from you guys, it's going to cost us uh, around half an hour to 45 minutes to do this multimedia uh, animation using um, any kind of uh, storyline or whatever. It will cost us two to three hours. So it was down to the, to the expert to tell us you have more options than that. From what I hear, this is not important to be part of session one. You don't need an infographic in session one. It's too early. Students, they won't even know what, what does it mean. We recommend that you do a little video. So they, they have a, a list of tools, and they have models that they can show us. And that's the consultation between sessions two and three. So in ses session two, you got the mandate to explore the options for storytelling or infographic. And you come back to us and say, actually, it's expensive and unnecessary in the overall design. Make sense? Yes. Um, and then I'll come to you. Even if one provides them with a basic outline, obviously it depends on the skills that lecturers already have. Yes. So my question is in terms of prerequisite skills that lecturers need yes, to good have yes. in order to take part of the, in the DDI. I think m lots of times we find that in our, in our carpodems, we do everything up until the production where it's there. Now the yes. person must go in. But I don't think we've necessarily paid enough attention to the skills development of the lecturer in terms of the technical skills. Yes. What is your prerequisites and how do you how do you go about making sure that lecturers do have that? I wouldn't call our academics as being technically skilled, but they are all aware of the possibilities. So one thing that is prerequisite and we give them, uh, and the templates have it, they are given a, a set of tools that they exist and what they are supposed to be doing and a list of exemplars. So we expect that they should be able to, to, to know that there is a wiki and a blog and a discussion forum and what these are for, so they make the recommendation. But it's not always the case that we expect them to be able to set it up. If we end up with a high prestigious design like this over here, Part of the action plan is, is development, skills development. Okay? We used to have a program called FLAME, which was about uh, learning and teaching and assessment for online. And we can say that for you to get the license to drive this design, you need to skill yourself. But it's not always the case. So we end up saying that, and that goes back to the action plan, that this kind of quizzes we will prototype one or two for you, and then you need to find a way around doing it. But you do have a window of opportunity of two months, three months, four months, whatever, to do it. Talking about time frames, and I know that you've said now, for instance, for your new programs or your po program review, yes. there will definitely be different time allocation yes. for contact sessions and yes. for consultations. Yes. But in terms of the time frame that you allow for a DDI, I mean, if you've got a new program and the modules and the outcomes have been determined, then obviously there is a timeline that you must finish. Uh, I can't start with a DDI six months before the module is no, to roll out. No, no. What time of time frames do you Normally, maybe can to be propose? Honest, we will not take anything than the DDI unit within a semester. We need at least a full semester 
before the commencement of that unit to do anything else. So the only, the only thing we do within six months is the DDI units. Anything else, it needs to be in, in a year plan. We are absolutely honest. Primarily because we know that to do some of these things that we speak, they also need university reapproval, at least in our university, which means that there is no point of us taking on a DDI existing program to be changed in a period of six months because it won't be, re it cannot be launched for the next academic year. It would be launched in the following academic year. Going, goes back to mapping the DDI in the academic calendar. Very important. It, it's unrealistic to expect someone to come in December to do a DDI and expect to have things up and running in January. Full stop. So we will say no, going back to the discussion. We say no to the DDI. We say yes to manage the damage, as we call it. We can help you do the two, three things without any particular thinking, just because you are in, in a rescue situation. But the DDI, you have to have two years implementation, we've seen, as they go. But it's the commitment that makes a difference. They know they are part of the DDI process. They're not abandoned, to put it frankly, even if it is a two year. And it's written, and it's been approved. The, the Master of Public Health, it was a relatively complicated course. It took us more than a year and a half to put it up and running. You had a question? When you were explaining the DDI course, yes. somewhere you mentioned, I don't know which session, when you were talking about the TSA of doing the social Yes. I just want to understand, I think Carol maybe will know why am I asking this question. Because um, in our company, we're talking about stakeholders, regardless of Yes. So I just want to say, who are these stakeholders? These are the general speaking, I suppose, the specific speaking element. But before I ask you, I just want to know who are the stakeholders? Okay. From a, it's, a, it's a tricky question. To do a DDI, the stakeholder should be at the high level. Like the true, like the stakeholder. Okay. The easy option is the stakeholders are students. Yeah, that's what we say. The stakeholders is the students, the main stakeholders. So we are doing what we do for the students. But in terms of stakeholders as being the recipients of the DDI, we are putting the, the level high up to at least the head of department and the academic teams. It is unlikely that the stakeholder will just be, actually, it will never be one academic. Never. And they know that. So they, 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 whatever they do, they do it in the bigger picture. They have, if they don't know the strategic framework of their faculty, they will, not, they, they will be asked to read it before they come to the DDI. It's very important to understand that they are part of the bigger picture. But the end result of the DDI, which is the design, the main stakeholders are the students. But seemingly, I can tell you that we haven't factored them in to the level that we want to factor them in. Yeah. Right? When you were talking about 90% of what the lecturers do yeah. and the rest of the people, I didn't hear the voice of the students. Yes. Very good question. So I just want to understand because as I'm sitting here, I am the voice of the students. Yes. And I wanted to see where I come from. Yes. Because I think, and I like it when you say the main stakeholder is the students. Mm. But where is the voice? Yes. Very, very good. We brought students in, in design thinking. We brought them in storyboarding. We failed. I don't know if we failed because we don't have, at least at Macquarie, an ethos of students as partners yet. But we brought students that they were either very much vocal towards one direction or they were very much passive. So it, if you bring students into the session, you need to know that the students, they are kind of aware about what they are they're talking about, what actually is happening. To bring students just to tell you, for example, that I want more online, it's, it's an easy thing. And if the students might say, we don't want lectures, we don't want this, we don't want the other. So we are trying now to work in a framework at Macquarie that is student representatives. 
So each unit, each module, it will have one member of, like one, uh, sorry, one student that they will capture all the concerns and all the issues for their year for the particular module. And so there will be a lot of them. There will be not one. There will be a body maybe in, in the BA. There will be around 70 students that they represent the BA. I'm more comfortable to say I would like the students, for example, to review our DDI things, but as a committee. I cannot really say that by bringing three students in a class represents the student body. I find this extremely problematic, and when I witness it, I said, okay, you just brought me now one or two more likely the most advanced students that they are willing to participate. So we have to work hard to find a student partnership model to bring this. So we haven't done it so far because I don't think we have a partnership program that makes me comfortable. Whereas I do believe that we do have a program level uh, committee and representation that the academics, they have the authority to represent what they do. That, that's the, the, the line. But I take your point. It could be in the review process. It could be in the production process, or everything. Yeah? Are we finished? Yes? If you have want to have a last word, you're more than welcome to, but our time is up. Okay. So there is um, lunch packs available. So we'll have lunch and then we can continue to talk to Prof. Panos. Our next session starts at 2. 2.30 30 only. Yeah. Goodness. So sorry. To four, I think. Okay, so we are you're more than welcome to, to still engage with um, Prof. Panos. Uh, we will start the next session then when 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 the program oh, on time. Okay, so thank you very much, thank Prof. Very Bonos, much for, for, for this information. I found it very informative and um, it really just gives us ideas of of things that we are still trying to yeah. figuring out. Um, I guess if I can say how we do Carpedem is that um, I think we should go and, and, and find more effective ways. Should we include more more other modules and should we do it in our calendar the first week of every month or how should we, 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 we still need to find a solution to that. But um, thank you so much for your input as well and for, for being here. Can I please just ask if everybody will do um, our CTL academic professional evaluation. So we will be evaluating all our sessions to get feedback. It's actually more a feedback uh, questionnaire yeah. for, for this session so that we can capture that. Okay. I, th I think this is for this one. Yes, yes. you're more than welcome yes. to. We will be here. They will be, uh, everybody will be here and the, the doors will be closed if everybody, anybody is going anywhere. Okay, thank you.